the budget highlights. Um, key services that we provide, obviously, uh, one of our most important responsibilities is implementing um, policies, initiatives, ordinances, et cetera, that are established by the Board of Selectmen. Our office also doubles as the Human Resources Department for the town. Uh, and that includes labor relations, benefits, um, recruitment, retention, play development, just you know the full spectrum of HR services. We also manage our risk management function, um, including our workers' compensation and general liability um, uh, matters. We are responsible for budget development uh, and do work very closely with Amy on that as well. Uh, we are also providing economic development support. So we are staffing the EDC and coordinate a number of our economic development initiatives. So the, um, the main increase in our uh, budget for the upcoming year, um, we have an anticipated uh, uh, maternity leave in my office and um, are looking for some funds to help with um, some part-time staffing while Melissa will be out um, on her maternity leave. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, it's just Chris. Congratulations. <laughs> um, so that, that is what that is for. When did that happen? <laughs> Let's clarify that Chris has nothing to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I don't have enough insurance for that. Let's, let's, let's move on. And then the, um, the other item where we're expecting an increase is we have already been made aware of at least um, four upcoming retirements in the fiscal year. Um, we may have some additional ones. We have some other folks who are exploring retirements in the upcoming fiscal year. Um, and so just as an expense related to that is that when we do need to recruit for those replacements, we need to advertise um, in online sources with professional associations, et cetera. So that, again, is just our estimate based on um, knowing that in addition to normal uh, attrition, we have a number of retirements And that's coming. the whole town, not your department, right? Because you have four I'm sorry, people correct. in your department. Yeah, yeah. Be, yeah that's correct. Thank, yeah, thank you for that clarification. So um, the advertising expenses for um, our various vacancies that happen throughout the town are uh, budgeted out of the manager's right. office. Well, yeah. you anticipate that there would be a net savings, though, as you... Bring in. There could be, there could be, right? So usually what you'll see, particularly for our folks who are represented by bargaining groups, is they have, at that point in their career, reached the maximum of the salary range. Um, and oftentimes, um, uh, folks are brought in at a lesser step. So um, there's a very good possibility that there would be salary savings. Under general government, um, so this budget uh, includes um, a number of our sort of townwide um, expenses. So our tuition reimbursement program for our employees, um, our copier and printing funds, uh, our town um, uh, townwide telephone service fund. So this is for uh, our landlines essentially, uh, organization wide training and development funds, and our postage for all departments. And a large part of this increase is due to our um, telephone service contract um, for the new system, as well as anticipated service calls. Uh, so that's a little over $10,000. We have also um, budgeted a $3,700 allocation for executive coaching. I had touched on this during our budget presentation uh, about two weeks ago now. We were able to reallocate $3,000 in savings from elsewhere within the general government budget to help offset this cost. Um, so really the, the true uh, increased cost would be about 700 to the budget, but think that this would offer a, really just an amazing opportunity on an annual basis for at least one member um, of our mid-level managers or upper-level managers to be able to have this opportunity. Right. And for community services, um, this is also the Board of Selectmen budget. Um, it's essentially flat. Um, this includes um, the first select person stipend, funding for various commission clerks, our legal notices, um, and some of our membership organizations such as CCM. We also include funding for our outside agencies um, that are not social services related. Um, and in the proposed budget, we had level funded uh, the outside agency requests, but we do have for later this afternoon flagged discussion. Um, so you can see um, which agencies have asked for increased funding and those agencies that asked for increased funding of $1,000 or more, we invited in just to speak briefly to you um, for why they were looking for that request. And then again, later in the afternoon, we will be asking you to decide if you would like to, um, from a policy perspective, increase the amount that we're funding to those outside agencies. Great, and Melissa's gonna take it from here. Yeah. Uh, so moving on to health, um, under tab five in your book, um, the line item for health is our contribution to the Farmington Valley Health District. And as you know, FVHD does serve as our, our local health department. It covers a total of uh, 10 towns, including us. This line item is going up 7.55%. 
uh, in fiscal year 21, uh, driven by a couple of factors. One, the per capita assessments increasing from $6.05 to $6.50. We did have a slight increase in our population, so we'll pick up a little bit of an additional cost there. Uh, secondly, as you heard from Jennifer Kirtan as the executive director of the district uh, back in January uh, when she presented an update on the strategic plan, the budget does include funding to meet the objectives in the five-year strategic plan for the district. Um, primarily, um, it's investment in additional uh, staff and expertise uh, for the district as well as an investment in accreditation. Uh, so again, as you heard from her back in January through her presentation, they do anticipate additional increases um, for the remaining years of the plan as well. So for our areas of focus for fiscal year 21, we'll continue to support the work of the Economic Development Commission. Uh, the EDC's current work plan, uh, which you've reviewed, is, is outlined there under those four sub-bullets. Uh, one, continuing our business, re business outreach events. Uh, secondly, continuing our outreach to our largest employers and taxpayers. Uh, so we're having monthly meetings uh, with one large employer or taxpayer every month so that we're visiting them all at least once per year. Uh, in addition, focusing on revisions to the existing uh, business incentive policy as well as updating our marketing materials, which we can use for tourism purposes, uh, recruiting businesses, and for realtors as well. So we'll continue to work with uh, the finance department on improving our financial management practices. You heard about um, the big one, the implementation of MUNIS, the new financial software system um, under Amy's presentation. We'll continue to refine our capital budgeting, uh, especially as we complete the town facilities master plan and the open space, uh, parks and open space master plan, incorporating those findings into our six year uh, CNR and CIP plans. We will continue to evaluate opportunities for sharing resources, uh, shared services with the Board of Education. As you know, we're currently piloting shared services in the area of finance uh, with Amy um, providing services right now to the Board of Education and the shared accountant position that we hope to bring on board uh, very soon. Uh, secondly, we talked about a little bit, Murray mentioned under the IT presentation that the Technology Task Force is conducting research on potential shared services models for IT as well. So we are currently negotiating five of our six labor contracts um, in this fiscal year, and we hope to settle those soon. So for the next fiscal year, we'll be focusing on implementing any uh, negotiated changes. And of course, we'll continue to monitor uh, the state budget and how that impacts us. Moving on to insurance, so we're in a... Oh. Oops. <laughs> Battery. Huh. Is it? Did you see your battery you said it was low? Yeah. So you're not plugged in correctly. <clears throat> it is plugged in. It's like a plug uh, in somewhere. Just not in there. Um, you have your. I was going to say, yeah. this is. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> this is an IT, yeah. IT yeah. ransomware <laughs> right here. <laughs> he really wants to fast track that extra personnel. <laughs> <laughs> I should never have mentioned that. <laughs> to boot up. Where did I put that? What? Budget's right here. No, no. <laughs> that muffin that I In the meantime, if you want to flip to tab 19 in the book. We're on the insurance the, tabs. We can go by the tabs. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Go with is this your favorite tab, Sean? Insurance? <laughs> I didn't know. I just... This is the most depressing tab, usually. <laughs> There's nothing we can do about it. Is it under town manager? My favorite is the capital tab, actually. Yeah, that's a fun one. CNR's fun. Like, we done yeah. general liability? Sorry. General <laughs> <laughs> okay, where? No, I think we're on the health insurance. Oh, there. Look at that. All right, so we'll qu quickly touch on um, both general liability and workers' comp. That's what you're seeing, uh, the line items in tab 19. Uh, we did receive uh, favorable indicators from Kerma, our insurer, for both uh, liability auto property as well as workers' comp, so we expect those to be flat. Um, the changes that you're seeing in the line items are actually related to the way that we charge back to WPCA. So as an enterprise fund, we do allocate um, their portion to them. Um, as a chargeback, so we wanted to make sure we were really charging them accurately, so we did a bit of an analysis, and after digging into it, we realized we did need to make a couple of adjustments to more accurately reflect what they uh, should be absorbing. 
on that front. So for liability auto property, we reallocated a larger share to WPCA. For workers' comp, it was the opposite. Um, so the general fund's picking up a little bit more there just to more accurately reflect um, what we should be charging WPCA. So in total, the reduction is about $3,000 for the general fund. And, and so abs if the, so move this forward a year, the, is it assuming there were no losses and assuming it was the same, assuming the results were the same, this would be a zeroed out. Right, with the exception of any potential um, change in either exposure. So if we do have, um, for some reason, payroll increases that we hadn't estimated, um, that might potentially impact us uh, slightly or... You know, uh, we did factor in like a half a percent just for exposure. Just for exposure. So that's, um, a, that's included in the budget. Right, or if something out of the ordinary happened, um, I, I can't think of what it would be, but, you know, mid-year perhaps we add a piece of... You know, we add something to the fleet that's not a replacement, but in addition to, or a new building came online, that would be in addition to. We would typically try and, um, again, just budget mm -hmm. for that because that would essentially increase our premium. Sure. Um, Splash pad, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah exa just exactly, because sure. that would be a new I, facility. Right. Sure. <laughs> it's just not happening. Okay, so if this is just a... Thank you. Double the GL for that thing. Yeah, and just a quick point on um, Kerma, our insurance carrier. One thing I, I do really appreciate about them um, is they really, I think, subscribe to their, their philosophy, which is member owned, member driven. Um, so they exclusively work with um, local public agencies in Connecticut, and um, they have a number of committees. Uh, Melissa is part of the risk management um, advisory committee, and I chair their operating and um, underwriting committee. So again, I think that us being actively involved in Kerma, um, they provide a lot of risk management services to us. They provide training to us um, I think we're just getting a lot of value there mm -hmm. they review contracts as well so they'll take a look um, at all of our contracts if we ask them to to check out the insurance um, and indemnification sections as well so they do that yeah. okay. health insurance is tab 25 go for it why don't you okay. go for it um, so less of a um, conversation than last year, hmm. uh, which is a good thing, because the fund is in a much uh, better position than it was a year ago. Um, so we anticipate that the fund balance at the end of fiscal year 21 will be 24% of expected claims, and our goal is 20 25 so, at a minimum. So we're yeah. pretty much there. We are having a better year, though, from a claiming experience <clears throat> than we anticipated. Yeah, yeah, yeah that as well. Mm -hmm. Do we feel better about the the new firm we're working with in terms of oh. projecting there because that was part of what got us in trouble in the past right is uh, we are. weren't doing a good job of on the outside of protect mm -hmm. projecting experience yes they've been amazing um I, I don't know amy or melissa would you guys like to to jump in on a few just the things that they've been really helpful with um i think like overall they're pretty much of an extension of our staff like I don't talk to them like consultants. <laughs> I just talk to them like another staff person. Okay. Pretty much you make a phone call, you send an email, you get a response back super quick. Um, when they take us through their numbers, they take, them, take us through them in detail and what went into them and how they came up with their projections. So um, I didn't work with our previous firm, so I don't have anything to speak of in comparison to, um, but I'm super pleased with, with okay. them. We get monthly claims, um, claims uh, monitoring and analysis, which is really helpful. Um, we're meeting with them on a quarterly basis, and the Board of Ed participates in that as well, just to stay on top of trends, issues. Um, really proactive in terms of, again, on their part, monitoring trends, helping us <coughs> dig into things. Um, you know, for example, might be the recent Connecticut Prime oh, sure. billing issue. Do you want to? Oh, yes. So that was a major find on their behalf. We got sent a bill for... $30,000 from CT Prime um, saying that that's what we owed based on our claims experience from the prior year. So we forwarded the email to our consultants and we said this looks a little off. Can you mm -hmm. dig into this? They dug into it. They looked at all the detail behind it. Um, CT Prime actually owed us a refund of $6,000 or $8,000. That's the stop loss carrier? Whoa. Yes, our, our former, prior stop our loss former carrier. carrier. Yes. yes. Yeah. So that's, yeah, I think that's just a really great example. Of We're out of that mess, value. right? Mm -hmm. Yes, correct. Do we need to go back and review prior years in there from CT Prime? I guess we could. We could. Because if they were off yeah. by that much in one year, were they perhaps off by other years? Sure. And now that we're no longer on the board. We could have them um, that. Mm -hmm. Additionally, so yeah, talk to me about stop loss insurance this time. 
the expenditures are up projected pretty substantially. Sure, and this was just a very um, conservative, um, conservative um, approach, wanting to say, okay, this is sort of what the market is doing. However, um, their unit that looks at stop loss for us, they're taking a look at it again. We don't think it's going to be that high. Probably, it won't be anywhere close to that. But again, just for budgeting purposes, because we're budgeting so early, and in terms of when they're going out and looking at stop loss for us, we just didn't want to be short in, in that regard. Um, but that is most likely an area where we would have savings. Yeah, let's get that firmed up before we send this to the Board of Finance. Who, who, who gave you that number? The <coughs> the, the yeah, the consultant um, provided that number to us, again, just for budgeting purposes. Um, rather have, you know, too much than not enough, but we don't think that the number is going to come in anywhere, probably likely near that that point. But I can see where they put that number in, because that number gave me a little bit of alarm, too, when I mm. first yeah, looked six, at it. 601 doesn't seem right. But if you Google it, there, the percentage <laughs> increase is actually that or higher right now. If That's a 20% increase. Yeah. We, we, we have we, seen a 25%. Are you, are you talking about municipal or are stop you talking loss. about stop loss in general? Um, when I Googled it, it was municipal. Huh. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and I'm surprised because, wow. again, hasn't our experience been above okay. average? Right, yeah. and m most likely that, like like Maria said, it won't come in that high because of those factors. Yeah. But if you're looking at what the market's doing and you're going to put together a budget, you're going to go based on market trend, and that yep. is the market trend. Mm -hmm. But we do think we're going to come in lower than that. Sure. But again, that's self-contained in the fund, so it doesn't change. Right. Right. The operating right. budget anyway. Right. Yeah. Okay. It just helps out our, our um, reserve at the end of the year if we yep. become positive. Yeah. Let's try to get that firmed up though, because we're going to spend a half hour on that one when we get to the public hearings. Yeah. So. Anything else on insurance? Yeah. We um. Our, our cyber, our EPL, our DNO, that's all embedded in the liability mm -hmm. coverage, right? Mm -hmm. yep. We have adequate limits. We've looked at that again. I'm not going to ask what they are in public, but we should make sure that they're keeping up with the trends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can get that to you, too, if you want to see. Also, the social engineering endorsement coverages mm -hmm. and all, all the other throw-ins that we need to be in there, because there's a lot of towns that you know, across the country that, oops, they didn't have the right coverage in place, so the taxpayers have had to foot bills for claims. Yeah. Um, Kerma has... Um, included cyber coverage through a separate carrier underneath our general liability, so it's included. Yeah, I would like somebody that I trust, like you guys, looking at that to make sure you're good with it, not Kerma. Because at the end of the day, the endorsements and the individual coverages really matter. So they can say we have cyber, there's 20 agreements in cyber. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if cyber is, it's a, they just say cyber, but there's a lot of different ways that claim can come in and mm -hmm. how we can get hit with cost. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and I'm not saying we go overinsured, but a couple of bucks ends up getting you additional insuring agreements that can really make a difference if we do get hit. There's also restoration coverage, there's betterment coverage, there's a lot of coverage out of the marketplace in the event that there is a loss mm -hmm. um, would behoove us to get because it helps put us in a better position if something does happen. Mm -hmm. so. All right, and then. Um, oh. Um, I think Sean's point is really good, and <clears throat> we are probably better to be, as he said, overinsured or have more insurance so that they have skin in the game we're not on the hook for something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I will say Kerma's done um, a really good job picking it up in terms of cyber. Um, you know, their their big thing is call us immediately when something happens, if and when something happens. I know they had a client who waited a week, ended up paying a ransom, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. I mean, they, uh, Kerma was still mm -hmm. there to help out, and they, you know, covered it, but they said they could have perhaps taken better action and not, wow. you know, had better outcomes if they had known right away, so. The carriers, <laughs> the carriers are, are staffed for 24-7, and mm -hmm. the yeah. moment you find out about it, you've got to report it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Because the longer you let it wait, the more expensive it gets. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's not cheap these days. All right. And then our office has uh, one proposed um, project. It's a compensation and classification study. Um, this project would provide us with a town-wide um, assessment of our current um, job classifications, our job descriptions, and an analysis of our existing pay grades. Um, to the best of our knowledge, we have actually never had one of these studies conducted here, um, which is a bit a bit surprising. Um, and uh, there are a lot of benefits to doing a study like this. You know, it's something I would recommend that we really try to do an organization-wide um, study about once every 10 to 15 years, and then update as 
as needed in between. Um, so a lot of times the updates in between might be perhaps there's a retirement, we want to restructure or um, you know, various reasons somebody makes reclassification requests. But again, having one of these comprehensive organization-wide studies probably once every 10 to 15 years would be a very, very good practice for us. Um, some of the benefits to doing such a study we can ensure that our, our job descript descriptions reflect current expectations, current technology, modern terminology. Um, we have some of our job descriptions that are decades old at this point, um, and they're just very dated. Um, we can also ensure that our pay grades reflect current market conditions. Um, but another important point, and this is where I think, um, again, would, this would be a huge, huge benefit to us internally, is trying to ensure pay parity among internal classifications and really basing that upon scope, scale, level of responsibility technical knowledge and educational requirements of the positions. Um, right now, um, we have issues that pop up on a pretty routine basis, again, in terms of what we would call internal parity um, within classifications, within bargaining groups, amongst bargaining groups. Um, so again, we just really think that this is something that would add a lot of value to the organization. So we've been doing this for as long as I've been on the board. So how is this different than what we've been doing at the personnel level as the positions come up and as we do? Sure. We've done like the chief's analysis. We've, we've done the, the department head analysis. There's been a lot of that that's been done in-house. Sure. So we have done some. Um, I think that's you know, something, again, that we've really tried to do the last couple of years is an absence. Typically, we would have um, a methodology in a scoring system um, that would assign points to positions, um, whether it's a new, a new position or we're looking at a reclassified position. <coughs> Basically, you would have categories similar to this. There would be points assigned. We, we don't have just a base classification system to work with. Um, so in absence of that the last two years, I think we've really done the best to um, utilize some different analytical tools to try to sort of get there um, with doing benchmarking, you know, salary benchmarking. Uh, you know, we will look to other communities um, for job descriptions that are more current. Um, we've been really also trying to do our very, very best to, to look at internal um, um, you know, pay comparisons, but again, the challenge there is that we don't sort of have that base classification system to work with. Um, but again, I think that we've done a pretty, pretty good job of using a um, reasonable analysis in absence of it. But again, that's, you know, maybe one position at a time where this would look at literally every single, um, you know, full-time position we have, as well as a handful of our part-time positions. So example, we would look at the entire public works department as one from band one all the way up. Yeah, every single position within the entire public works department. So whether you're a mechanic or a truck driver or a crew leader, uh, a road foreman, yep. every single position. So I want to say this delicately, but there's no way anything's going down. So sometimes, sometimes that happens, and it's within a within union negotiation. Sure. So what um, we kind of refer to in our field that we call that red circling people, um, and so sometimes uh, the results of the the study, if they show that we're Way over, way over, or sometimes it's even internally um, that we're just way overcompensating somebody. Um, usually they're frozen at where they are until over time general wage increases catch up to them. Um, and then if they leave, the incumbent, I'm sorry, the person who's hired to follow that incumbent comes in at the appropriate pay grade and the appropriate step. Um, Interesting. So yeah, so we just kind of call that red circling usually um, when that happens. Um, Usually read anything's a bad thing, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, some, and sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes you find, right, that we're not, you know, compensating people mm -hmm. adequately. And sometimes people are right on target. Um, so it is kind of just, there's just a range um, of what happens. And then there's a process to really kind of work through that if we find out that we um, really need to do a full adjustment and if we do um, need to start gradually, you know, increasing other individual salaries. So there is sort of a whole other process yeah. to the implementation phase. Um, but again, I think a really good outcome for this as well um, would be having current job descriptions for us um, because that is something we're, we're mm -hmm. really lacking right now. Yeah, just on your point, I think that yes, we've been doing this all along looking them, but we've really been doing it one off kind of case by case as, mm -hmm. as you guys said. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of created <clears throat> some internal equity issues because we take them one at a time. We're not. They weren't always lo looked at Actual. in terms of how they compare organization-wide. So I think, like Maria said, we need a good base to work off of and make sure that we kind of clean that up and okay. start fresh. Mm -hmm. Do we have someone in mind that we're? we've looked at to use for that? So there are a lot of different firms yeah. that do this, particularly municipal work. Um, we do have a list of just maybe, I think it was maybe six or eight firms just initially um, to, to reach out to if we do receive funding. We would okay. do an RFQ for this okay. particular yeah. type of a study um, and, and select a vendor from that. 
I can see us getting substantial pushback to put this in CNR. Our, our friends down the hall typically don't like us to do studies in CNR. This would be more of a cash or if, if it's a one-time hitter, you put it in the operating budget. So. Yeah, so I, what I would advise, particularly for a project like this, a study like this usually takes, I would say, a minimum of 18 months. So it's likely that it's not going to be neat and tidy within one fiscal year. Mm -hmm. um, so if it's in a CNR project, that gives us the ability to roll the funds forward for the project. So Fair we would enough. be able to um, to pay the consultants. Um, and then another piece um, with the job analysis and the job descriptions, um, you know, I find it's helpful and beneficial um, to have uh, union leadership involved mm -hmm. early and upfront. Yes. Um, and But that's also, you know, Mm -hmm. adds to the to the time in terms of implement, uh, both preparing and then implementing. Um, but just again, the preparation of the study, I would say we're probably looking at at least 18 months. And how does that coincide? So we're, we're negotiating five of the six contracts. Presumably those get settled and closed before we do this. Mm -hmm. Are we then so, having to redo that work again? Uh, so my recommendation would be hopefully we would have everything done for the next contract so we could be talking about any potential implementation within the next contract. So what are we looking at? For th are we looking at three-year contracts? Yeah, for the uh, yeah for most of the groups, yeah. Okay, just trying to make sure the timing lines up, and then obviously we need to be transparent with the board of finance that there's a potential, not a not an assumption, but a potential that salary line items will go up as a result of this. Some or change. could, some could, some could, but that again would be negotiated as well with the yeah. unions. Yeah. But that's and again, if we're underpaying people, we should be clarifying that and fixing mm -hmm. that for sure. Um, but again, if we're going to embark on the study, we just need to be eyes wide open with everybody that's involved. Right. Yeah, and something that's important too, and, and if we do get the study funded when we're asking questions, with the pay parity piece, um, oftentimes we do see in, in our municipal setting, um, there can oftentimes be um, gender equity say, issues, particularly yes. with positions that were more traditionally held by women. So, um, you know, a good example I'll, I'll often use is, you know, sometimes you would see um, social workers with a master's degree required or a librarian with a master's degree required being paid less than code enforcement officials who were required to only have a high school degree. Um, again, sort of that difference between positions traditionally held by men versus women we do tend to see that a lot in our municipal setting um, so that's again something that that really will helpfully you know if we select the right consultant and we're doing the proper internal and external analysis it will help us um, with pay parity in that regard as well that'll be a specific deliverable though yeah Is any, that, that any, would be any very gender gaps in the pay because that's exactly important. that's very important those. very Absolutely. important yeah okay and again we're not suggesting that they are there but they could be there they, could they be. are there they could let's be. get rid of them exactly. because they shouldn't be there exactly it would be an issue is we have <coughs> we have a leadership team which is strikingly and proudly made up predominantly of females which mm -hmm. i think is this whole town, the town hall is filled with um you know leaders who are females so it'd be interesting to see how this comes across yeah, yeah. but well, again if there is in the in the rank and file we need to stamp it out if it exists mm -hmm. yeah so. now chris to that point chris no you're absolutely right um at this point uh we believe that we are actually the only town in the state with a town manager form of government where the manager, deputy, and finance director are all women. Um, and I'm at this point, I think I'm only one of three female managers in the state. So, um, yeah. Okay. 2.66 grand loaf, triple eight. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, it is something that I think that we are really no, tuned into is, is the gender equity <laughs> <and> issue. <laughs> 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 it's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Wow. They got to get rid of us. Wendy and Jackie are on the show. All right. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. What's next? You're up, Mike. Oh, wow. You just ripped your four, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Yep. It was oh, like, oh. we weren't even looking. <laughs> All right, Amy oh, gets an A plus for efficiency. Sorry. I should have. I should have just asked quickly. Did anybody have questions on probate? No. Okay. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Gordon. So start off with planning and building. Uh, overall. It's a 0.91% increase of the two departments. Um, planning is actually a decrease of just under three quarters of a percent. Uh, building is an increase mainly due to, and I'll talk about it later, is salary uh, increases, uh, step in uh, con contractual requirements. Um, this is a budget that maintains the current staffing levels at seven and a half uh, staff members between the building department and planning. Um, 
we've already talked about this in the past, but you know our functions. We, we're the primary, uh, from the planning and land use perspective, uh, providing in, uh, staffing to the various land use commissions, also implementing the various land use regulations, ordinances, code enforcement, et cetera, um, across the board. While the building department, they're maintained with implementing the, build, the state building code, the town underground tank regulations, and, and deals with some other you know, public safety issues as it relates to buildings and structures. Um, I just want to get two figures out, especially to the building department. Uh, last year, uh, we, we processed <coughs> 2008, uh, 2,087 permit applications for construction value of $103,412,000. Um, the building department was, has been extremely busy with inspections, and Henry and Dwight have been doing a fantastic job of keeping it together. Um, really, I really want to point those two out because they, you know, um, they're doing, we, they did 2,799 inspections last year. Um, this is all the various projects, and I'll call, I'll, later in my presentation I'll talk about where we stand in some of those projects. Um, That's an astounding number. For mm -hmm. Yeah, we are half employed, full time employees. For, you know, example, the previous community I came from, um, the town of Waterford, similar size population. They had three full time inspectors. Really, we have one and a half because Dwight's position is shared with the town of Bloomfield, so he's only here Monday, Tuesday, and every other Friday, and yet they they are still keeping the ball rolling on in inspections and just like I said, really a fantastic job. So. Some of the areas of focus for this uh, uh, budget, we're, wrap, we're going through doing amending our zoning regulations, kind of making it more user friendly. Um, we're hoping that that actually, the zoning commission may be sending to a public hearing in April, but that project in itself is still, it's kind of a, a living project. It will, it will live on to the next uh, fiscal year because there are certain things out of what we're doing right now, such as the uh, planned area development regulations, the sign regulations, the parking regulations, and the town ride zoning regs that we did not tackle in the first project. We did not look at the center code, although the zoning commission wants to look at the center code. So that whole, that comment of reworking zoning regulations is gonna be ongoing projects. The main goal of these, these, these projects are to, my next point is making it a user-friendly format to address issues that um, We've heard, uh, we've heard feedback from either uh, residents or developers, how our regs are confusing, or just the results that occurred at some of our regulations where, you know, maybe it wasn't exactly what the commission envisioned. Um, the other, just the overall implementing the goals and objectives, the plan of conservation development. Um, that's that document by state, by state law. We're required to update once every 10 years. The, when I say we, the planning commission. Um, the Planning Commission actually has taken uh, on the task of updating the POCD at year three. So we're discussing it right now. We're looking at areas of economic development, affordable housing, and uh, sense of place as some of the focus that this, this new update will be. Um, and we're doing it outside of our 10-year 10, 10 mandate. What's nice about this is that 10-year window will start after we finish our update this year, so we're gonna be able to push it out further. And we're doing this in-house, so I'm working with the Planning Commission. I will be uh, doing that work. Um, we will not be engaging the services of a consultant, just like the, uh, the Zoning Commission uh, uh, reg updates. That's something I've, we've been working on in-house. The last one is implementing our new building permit software. We'll talk about that later. Um, we're looking to switch vendors because our contract is expiring in July. Um, and I could, I'll go into further detail about that when we get into our capital. So I said it earlier, the really highlights, uh, we have one increase, it's in the, bud, the building department. Um, it's, it's relatively small numbers, uh, you know, 3,000 of the $8,000 that's part of the increase is due to uh, negotiated contractual step increases. Um, the other kind of challenges or trends that we're seeing, I already said earlier about how we really want to focus on um, going one step further and making the, uh, looking at ways that this is more of a user-friendly process. You know, some of the comments that we've, I've heard from people, whether they're anecdotal or they're uh, current, they kind of, they, they allude to the fact that 
the process is not user friendly that they just that that for some reason it's confusing so one of the other projects that we're going to look at um, as we're wrapping up the first phase of the zoning regulations update is looking at doing a a, a handbook that will kind of guide uh, uh, developers resident residents to kind of understand the process the other kind of trend or challenge is this is a big one is I said it last year that the FEMA flood maps are being updated um, those draft maps will be coming out this spring um, which could result in people either being mapped into floodplains or mapped out of floodplains mm -hmm. they did uh, surveys they have uh, take the data from the surveys they've actually re-engineered the study in the maps I have not seen the maps yet I've been part of a remap pro uh, process when I was down in New London County and it, it, it's going to be a luck of the draw which one we're going to get whether it's going to be a lot of people are mapped out of the floodplain or a lot of people are going to be mapped in but either way just I want to say this is something that's big um, DP has contacted us as hosting a meeting in April to it possibly will be the unveiling of the new draft maps but um, you'll hear from people I mean Jack you'll know for, as a real estate agent that's one of the things everyone will ask about when they're first looking at houses mm -hmm. With these new maps, the banks will be aware of it. Jeez. They will be sending out letters, especially if people get mapped into the floodplain who are not currently in the floodplain. So they may not be too pleased when they find out they have to now carry an insurance policy upwards of five, ten, twenty thousand dollars. Or worse, as people who are in the floodplain now find out that your house is it's it's exposed to a higher degree of of uh, hazard. Therefore, your coverage has to be increased. You know, you may hit find out people that are paying ten thousand dollars in insurance right now that now will have estimates saying you're going to pay close to twenty or thirty. We have people in town that are paying around twenty thousand dollars in flood insurance right now. Oh my gosh! So those people could feel the pinch uh, when these new maps come out. So I just really, as a public service announcement, it's a challenge that our department will face, but it's also just to, once again, get that word out that this project is coming and will come, on, will come online during this uh, fiscal year. Mike, I will send you an email to remind you, but I would be grateful if you could write up a blurb for my first selectman's report so we could start yeah. that education. We, we just received a discovery report from our meeting. It was back in, I want to say January or December. It's been that long since we met with uh, FEMA. So yes, that was just issued in the past, like, I don't know, two days. Yeah, we popped it in the packet under communication just to kind of start getting some information out there. So one of the ideas that I, I kind of floated with, no pun intended, um, with, <laughs> with uh, Diane Ipkovich at DP is, is potentially asking, when the new maps come out, I know they did this in New London County, uh, they, they had a, a region meeting and the region one staff came out um, DP staff was there and they provided an ability for homeowners to come to the meeting and talk to someone at a federal agency someone at a state agency and ask their insurance correct uh, questions directly to the individuals that will they'll eventually have to deal with at the same time it was a great process to have them actually see the new maps so I was I've been asking uh, Diane to possibly schedule that once these maps come out and if so yes I will kind of get the word out through this board so great. that we can make sure people are aware Mike two things one there's no appeal process here that when the maps come out it is what it is right no there's an appeal process right. of 90 days because this is going to be a re unlike so in 2008 that was the last update in Hartford County. Mm -hmm. That was a map modernization pro uh, pro program where okay. basically they took the 1979 study and they took an aerial photograph and put the two together and said, here's your new maps. Sounds Whether they're good. right or wrong, here's your maps. Yep. Um, this process, however, because it involves uh, surveying, it involves engineering of the survey data, there will be a 90-day appeal process. Okay. But when that, come, when that appeal process starts, the onus is going to be on the the applicants or the homeowners to say hey I got I got an engineer I got a surveyor I got this I got that let me show you my professional data why these maps are incorrect it, it, but it really it's going to be two engineers two surveyors fighting it it won't be homeowner and uh, and it could be expensive process for the homeowners mm -hmm. yeah well, it could be cheap in the long run. Um, yeah. And follow-up question to that, any exposure from town-owned assets 
to potentially get <coughs> redrawn into the floodplain and uh, commercial, substantial commercial parcels. So one of the, one of the things that we're look, we've been working with is WPCA mm -hmm. and the berm around the WPCA facility. Mm -hmm. um, they are watching this process closely mm -hmm. because I've I've said you know maybe it's maybe it's a time that we entertain either getting the berm uh, certified as a levy, meaning it'll get removed from the map, or two is apply what's called for a letter map amendment now. And that, what that means is FEMA looks at the topography, looks at your engineering data and says, okay, this thing, this structure, this property is now out due to topography, due to engineering errors. Um, this, we noticed the engineering error when uh, uh, Gerard Brothers uh, applied for a LOMA with, they actually applied for a CLOMAR, which is a conditional letter map amendment with uh, FEMA. And they were uh, able to demonstrate there was a mathematical error of 0 0.01 in the elevation data for the flood insurance study. Oh, and that nice. resulted in mo with the property as it stands on the map, the flood line up by Ironhurst Boulevard being moved to the, the basically rear third of the property. Hmm. Um, so there's possibility out there, you know, okay. that's one that, like I said, yeah, I was moving so. that. So. Yeah, and just, I mean, <clears throat> so individual homeowners, but, I mean, is there a point where the municipality gets involved because of the effect of the value on our properties and our taxpayers overall, or do we stay entirely out of the process? We'll evaluate that a as the maps come out and probably advise the town manager through, or the town manager to this board if there's facilities that are affected, such as the WPCA, mm -hmm. that it's in our best interest maybe to yeah. appeal that. Okay. But, I mean, until we see a draft map, I, you know, I, I don't want to comment. It could go in our favor, too, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And that's the other thing, because that's why we were waiting for a draft map for WPCA, for example. I hate to keep picking on Tony, but um, w the, the position's been, you know, if it's in our favor, we're not going to spend a dime on, on fighting the map. If it's, if it's against us, we're going to look at every option available and what makes sense and what, is, what we're going to see an economic return in correcting that map. Okay. So um, we wanted to go over and kind of update you on some of the projects. I already told you the value and number of, of construction, uh, construction permits issued. So public projects, we're still dealing with the Henry James addition. That's, that's been a very large project, very consuming for um, uh, Henry and Dwight. Commercial projects is kind of a big one, big Y construction. Um, obviously, everyone can see the walls are up now. Steel is supposed to be being delivered as we speak. Um, their anticipated opening date is October 1, um, but with the, the unusual winter weather that we've had, they may actually be open by September 1. So that's going to be on your grand list. That's a new store, 52,000 square feet. Um, McLean Independent Living, that's 74 apartment units that are being constructed in the location where the uh, cottages are, the independent living cottages are located. Uh, we're meeting with them next week. They're looking to start site work. So very likely that project will be coming in for building permits probably late June, early July. So it's going to, I, to say that it's going to come in on this fiscal year of 2021, it may make it as the last big project in the current fiscal year. But still, that's an extremely large project. You know, the footprint of that building, it connects to Burke Holder. It's approximately 200,000 200, square feet. Um, it, it's it's a huge investment by McLean. The last one is Ensign Bickford Aerospace and Defense. So they finished phase one ahead of, time, ahead of schedule. They're actually looking at phase two right now as putting some further investments in this. So this is, you know, some projects that are going on right now. Um, right. As for residential development, I'm sure everyone hears about this. Uh, the Ridge at Talcott Mountain, 60, 269 out of 301 uh, residential units have been issued permits. 208 certificate of occupancies have been issued as of last Thursday. Um, Highcroft, they're working on the second phase. There's 48 townhouses. Total is 272 units out there. That's with the apartment development. Uh, the townhouses have been permitted at this point. They are really coming along on those townhouses. I anticipate that they'll be coming in for cert certificate of occupancies this spring. Um, as for uh, Cambridge Crossing, that's off Hoskins Road. There's 79 single-family uh, homes that are part of that development. Nine certificate of occupancies have been issued with 18 uh, building permits pending. Um, 
So those are some of the larger resident. I don't know if anyone else has any, any other residential development questions in town. What about the one on Climax, the smaller one? So that's 19 <clears throat> houses on four and a half acres. That was approved. How many? 19, 19 on four houses on yeah. four and a half acres approved mm. by the courts as an affordable housing application. Um, of the 19 yep. houses, six are under construction. Yep. He has sold three affordable units. So he's actually following his plans. Okay. He has applied for six additional building permits. Um, we're working on some grade changes, though, that he wants to implement. But, I mean, he's really cruising along on that development. Yeah. Um, I see it. They've already so, done the they've and, already done and some you, site work. You have, like I said, three of them that are affordable units that he sold for individuals making 60% of the area me medium income. So really, I mean, if you look at it, it's a dense development of four and a half acres, but at the same time, you have three new homeowners that just moved to Simsbury that are making it 60% of the area median income. So you, you, mm -hmm. you get, were able to provide entry-level housing to someone who may not have looked at this community. Which so, is outstanding. The problem is that there's 16 where they're barred from coming in because mm -hmm. they're too high. So, yeah. so what's the, what's the, uh, the sale price of a unit like that? Two size, two seventy-five. Two no no the the sixty percentile one was going for two hundred and I want to say two hundred twenty thousand dollars. And what's the that. size of it? I don't have I I, I don't know that figure so offhand. Like in the, is it like in the twelve hundred square foot like that? I, it would be under like fifteen hundred square feet. The balance of them are starting in the four hundreds, all right? High Correct. Threes. The market rate ones. Yeah. Hmm. So, but. It's, it's a good thing. I mean, he's building houses and people are buying them. So we're not seeing vacant houses stand. Um, so we want to just hit on a few uh, potential developments. I don't know if everyone's aware, but there's 18 acres, which is north of the Hoffman Auto Group, basically on top of the hill. Mm -hmm. It was rezoned. It was originally zoned residential. It was rezoned to commercial. There's been some interest in that. That is a parcel where we could see some significant commercial development in the next year. Powder Forest, there's been uh, interest on the uh, commercial uh, piece that's kind of at the intersection of Hop Meadow Street and Powder Forest Drive. It was approved for 68,000 square feet of commercial development. We had a group looking to build a hotel there. Um, I, they seem- like The big area, it's kind of the big sand pit right now. That's correct. Yeah. And then just north of it, if you remember the parcel that was used during uh, 2011 for the yeah. DPW to bring all the storm damage, yep. that was a, on the master plan, it was shown as being a uh, assisted living facility, which has been purchased by Seabury. There's been talk on and off that Seabury may be coming in with something. Hmm. Um, I think that they've been real occupied with their project in Bloomfield first, so yeah. it'll be interesting because that's kind of winding down now. So. That's a wild card of the mix. And then we have three other, three other potential redevelopment projects in the center of town. They're in various stages. I, I don't really want to publicly say where those, what projects those are, but they may show their face, and those are kind of wild cards that could see a significant interest in the downtown and are pretty modest-sized developments, each of them. Good um, question, though. That, I thought that was Hoffman of Avon. That's Simsbury? Aren't they Hoffman of Avon on the sign? I think they're Hoffman. Oh, okay, of Avon. I just I get confused. Yeah. Yes. But they're Simsbury. <laughs> they're located in Simsbury. So we have one CNR project. I kind of discussed this earlier. Our building permit software. Uh, the current contract expires in July. We ha we need to go to a new vendor. Um, I know Amy will kind of vouch me on this. That <laughs> the customer oh, service hardly. is uh, I don't know horrible. Yeah. <laughs> so we are looking to switch to Municity. It is a, uh, a, a software provider that is, uh, that is a vendor through CROG. Um, the capabilities of this software is amazing. Um, some of the things that allow, I mean, online permitting will still occur. Um, the other uh, sort of capabilities it offers from a construction inspection standpoint, it allow the building officials to do their inspections out in the field take pictures on tablets, upload the reports directly to these files, so then homeowners would be able to see, whoa, I failed my electrical inspection, well, why? And there's a picture why they failed it, along with the inspector's notes. Right now, we're still in the 
the days of handwriting our inspection mm. notes. And so if someone were to fail an inspection, you literally have a handwritten note from Dwight or Henry that you got to decipher. So what exactly were they trying <laughs> to tell me what my contractor did? The other thing that this will offer is, so the public will be able to go online to sign in and you can enter a property and say, hey, did this property uh, obtain the proper permits for a new roof? finish their basement instead of right now you have to come into the office you, you have to we have to physically search the files and it's multiple files because it's not just what's open because you know there could be closed permits this will allow the real estate agents for example to access our records remotely so this it's a really like we're really excited hopefully this is implemented this year um, and we looked at the we had there was two vendors this was the one vendor that stood out based on their service we went to the town of southington to look at how they actually have this software right now um, we spoke to the town of milford connecticut the, my former employer has it the town of waterford um, there was a few other communities we, we really we did our research we felt that this gets we're really to get a return on investment on this on this software and really it's going to increase our uh, services that are offered through the building department and really the cutting down on some of the the admin costs associated with their inspection notes it's just it's amazing to have that ability Thanks, so. just to add to that too this software integrates with the assessor software so there's no more data manual entry in the department it's great awesome. does it yeah. flag when the permits that's, don't get inspected that's a two for one i don't know you sean <laughs> <laughs> So we monthly, we're going to get a report on all the ago. permits that are inspected and not inspected at the Board of Selectmen. <laughs> you can review that. I'm going <laughs> to. So that's it. Other, other questions? Okay. Good update. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Mike. All right. We're going to turn next to Kristen. So. So I'm Kristen Formanak, if we haven't formally met yet, um, and I'm here to talk to you this morning about the Community and Social Services proposed budget. Um, I think we've had a pretty exciting year this year. We've had some really big accomplishments, and we've added some new programs and services, um, and I'm here to answer any questions that you might have this morning. Um, overall, our budget has not changed um, that much. Some of the changes that you'll see that I'll talk about later um, are because of the way that we're managing our funds now and where we're going to be accounting for some of our funds. So that um, is part of our fluctuation. We have a um, small increase in the administration costs, and that's mostly related to our step increases and our, um, our negotiated wage increases. And the senior center, um, there is a small decrease overall, and again, some of that I will talk about later is because of where we're um, allocating the funds. There is a slight decrease in our senior center transportation program, our dial a ride, um, and the main driver for that is I'll speak about later. We went out for a bid on our contract this year. Um, we have 5.71 budgeted FTEs in our program. Um, these are some highlights. Senior services um, is very um, important to us. Our senior center is an integral part of the community for our seniors. Um, we provide a very wide range of programs and services, um, many special events. We um, very much focus on intergenerational programming with our younger folks in the high school. Um, we offer a lot of programs at the library where we can bring our different generations together. Um, we've recently started adding more veterans programming. Um, we started a monthly coffee hour with our veterans, and we are bringing in um, a variety of speakers. And um, what's, the, what's how, you know, you're probably getting up and creating 
noise and awareness, how's the attendance of that? Actually, it's very good. Um, we have a good core group of veterans that have been coming every month. Um, we're advertising through our senior communicator, through flyers um, on Facebook, and also um, one of our best partners is Resilience Grows Here, which is a project program of the Farmington Valley Health District. So they really help us in promoting yeah. this, um, this effort. And in a few weeks, you will also hear a presentation from um, a volunteer who works with Resilience Grows Here and is a member of the Elizabeth Dole Foundation. We're going to be asking you to um, become a Hidden Heroes town. Um, so you'll hear more about that in a couple of weeks. But that's an exciting new um, veterans um, program that we're going to be looking to offer. Is that, I'm sorry, is that, pro I'm just, is that program uh, I mean, is it a pretty good spread of generations, or is it right now skewing towards a certain age? Perhaps? The veterans programming? Yeah. Um, we tend to see our older veterans, um, so our older wars. We don't have a lot of our younger veterans that come to our programs, um, but the younger veterans tend to go to the programs through Resilience Grows Resilience here. Resilience Grows? Okay. Yeah, um, and there is a new coffee um, coffee talk that just came online through the Hidden Heroes program that's actually been added on at our Simsbury Starbucks. And that's a lot of our younger veterans and their families. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. That was cool. Um, we have weekly and monthly congregate meals. As you know, last year we added on our Tuesday lunch cafe program. Um, that has gone very well. Um, our numbers aren't quite as high as we had hoped, but it still is um, sustaining itself. And um, we also have seen our employees enjoy that option as well. Um, we have many games and clubs, a lot of fitness programs, education, music, socialization, um, our trips and outings, which are also supported through our dial or ride enhanced program so that we're able to provide transportation for our out trips. Um, and we're the municipal agent for the elderly by statute. Um, many programs or services through social services. Um, we maintain a very robust and healthy juvenile review board, youth services programming. Um, we've partnered very well with our schools to provide those services. Um, we've continued to add on to our sensory friendly series. Um, we're looking to provide some new programs this spring. We're going to be bringing in um, animal assisted therapy, a presentation on that and that's through our youth service programming. Um, with social services, we continue with our direct service, uh, making sure that people have their basic benefits and are able to um, hopefully thrive in our community. Um, our biggest clientele are our folks that are low income, um, and we provide direct service to them. And um, new also, we are in our second year of providing choices counseling, which was added on, I think, my first year that I was here. Um, and then our, our typical services a lot that are by statute, such as helping with evictions and um, being the fair housing officer and the veterans affair officer. Come on, you worked for me the first time. Okay. <laughs> um, areas of focus for the upcoming year. Um, some of our services and programs that we've expanded and added on. This year, we offered a new program in conjunction with our police department. Um, it was a, a rape defense class that we offered, and that was uh, went very well. We got a lot of very positive feedback and gratitude from the participants for having been able to offer that. Um, and now that we own the equipment, we're going to have conversation with the police department on hopefully being able to provide that um, at least once a year. And um, I already spoke about additional sensory friendly activities that we're going to be adding on the um, veterans program, which you will be able to hear about soon. You're also going to be hearing about um, our initiative to become a recovery friendly community that will be this coming up Monday. Um, and that is part of our recently received um, state mini grant focusing on opioid use disorder and um, reduction of that in our community. Um, our partners on that, we're really excited. We're partnering with A Promise to Jordan and with Farmington Valley Health District. Um, we also have a, a new committee that you're going to be hearing about soon. Social services has been um, an integral part in um, 
the up and coming and evolving spirit committee which was a direct result of the work that we did last year with our depart with the department of justice um, taking a look at equity and equality concerns and issues in the community um, and you'll hear more about that at their presentation in april um, so i guess i can say that we've been busy <laughs> Um, and we're going to continue to do that good work. Um, some of our budget highlights, we have our increase in our full-time salaries due to general wage increases and negotiated contractual step increases. Um, we also are reflecting our $8,000 town match to, for the Youth Service Bureau funding. It's going to be noted in the operating transfers, so that's why you, you'll see a little change in the dollar amounts there. Um, the increase that you see here for the senior center part timeline um, it really did not increase by that amount but we I know uh, Maria has been working on and Amy in really showing you what our expenses are and where the funding is coming from um, a bulk of our funding for the senior lunch program for Wednesdays is from our Belden trust so we're showing you the actual cost of running that lunch program um, and we're very grateful to our trustees for continuing to support that lunch program um, and we had a small impact from the minimum wage increase. So you'll see that small um, increase over the years. Okay. Um, the, there was a decrease in the senior center um, in our contracted services line item. Um, and I think that Maria had kind of walked you through how some of those changes were going to be happening and reallocating some of the funds over to um, culture, parks, and recreation. And we're going to be working with Amy moving forward on how to um, really better look at our um, own <coughs> special revenue account for the senior center and um, how we're taking in our funds and paying our vendors. So more information on that to come. Um, there was a small decrease, as I said, in our senior transportation in our dial-a-ride. Um, it had been several years since we had gone out to bid for our dial ride contract and we felt that it was um, appropriate to do that. So we did go through that process last uh, last spring and um, we are still with our current vendor. He came in with the best product and service for us and we're very happy with him. That's Martel Transportation. Um, we are also reflecting in the budget the funding that we receive in um, grant revenue from the state and our um, enhanced dial ride program revenue. Um, trends and challenges, uh, we just continue to try to do a really good job to help people as they continue to face challenges around lack of work um, or work that is not enough to sustain their family. Uh, we are going to this year, you'll see in an upcoming slide, um, we're going to be applying for a grant to replace our oldest dial ride vehicle. Um, and we're continuing to collaborate with our other town departments to provide our programs and services. And this is um, the slide regarding the dial ride ban. Our projected cost with the, the current vendor is about $63,000 to replace our vehicle. Um, there is a grant that's available through um, Greater Hartford Transit, and that grant is an 80-20 split. Um, with 80% of the grant, 80% of the funding for the vehicle coming from the grant and 20% coming from us. Um, we don't anticipate that the general fund will have to support this project. We do have um, enough money in our dial -a ride pass fund that will cover that 20%. Um, and then next year you'll also see um, a request for our, to replace our second vehicle. We've been a little off track with replacing our vehicles. They haven't been replaced in a while and we'd like to get back onto a routine cycle of making sure that our vehicles are current. And, oh, that was the end for me. So, <laughs> okay, um, Do you uh, have any just, questions um, for me? Thank you. I just wanted to highlight, I just made a really um, incomplete list here. Um, if the things that um, you support, Community for Care, JRB, Spirit Council, the Age-Friendly Community Initiative, the Hidden Hero City Initiative, the Recovery-Friendly Community, and I'm sure that's like a quarter of it. What, uh -huh. <laughs> what help do you need from this group? Um, you know, I think that right now it's just my main goal to keep you um, updated on how things are progressing. Um, and Maria and I have been having some conversations about those committees and how we're interfacing and how um, to move forward with them. Um, we, as you know, 
in the previous budget season had been awarded the funds to hire a new social worker. Um, we had done that and unfortunately our first staff person did resign. Um, so we have just hired another social worker. She's also a licensed clinical social worker, so there are two of us on staff now. She just came on board in January. Um, so right now we're going through the process of training her and I think I would have a better answer for what we need after that sure. process. Um, we've been really careful about um, spreading out the liaison duties because we do have so many boards yeah. and commissions that we support. So between Kathy Marshall, our senior center coordinator, myself, and our new social worker, um, we're going to be looking at who can who can take on those responsibilities. Um, and I'm also wanted to thank you again for um, supporting my clinical license. Um, I just wanted to share with you that um, I had been able to move through the process a lot quicker than we had hoped or anticipated um, and that did save the town money. I was able to utilize um, funds that were left over last year to speed up the clinical process and take my exam um, much sooner than we had anticipated. So okay. I'm licensed. I'm also registered now as a national health care provider. So it's kind of cool for us. Congratulations. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. <coughs> do you guys have, do, do you, um, I know you coordinate with the with um, the school's mm -hmm. social work, um, the very prof various professionals. But do you guys have a, um, just curious, do you guys have like a standing just sort of team meeting where you get together and review, th review stuff, integrate with them, or is it as is it based upon cases? cases um, I think our work is so different that I don't see the need to have a regular meeting. Um, which is good. I like, is, as a manager, I like that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's good management. Thank you. Um, we do have regular meetings with our Youth Service Bureau. Um, we meet four times through the school year, and that's our um, regular contact meeting with the psychologists, the social workers, and other members of the staff. Um, last week, we just did our big project with the school where we supported their um, day-long effort of disconnect to connect. Um, where they had all of the students and staff not use electronics for a day. Um, and then I communicate regularly with the social workers and with the school nurses about referrals for our family therapy program. Any other questions? Great, thank you, Chris. You're welcome. Thank you. I think we can squeeze the library in before lunch. You really yeah. need yeah, the right. microphone more directed at me. <laughs> He's loud enough. Oh, and Tom, loud. Tom Tabersky, you're on. You're on deck. I think we'll try to um, get to you before lunch as well, since your members are here. For my props. Well, it is still good morning, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm here this morning to present the library budget. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but Pew Research actually did a study recently, and libraries topped the list of common cultural activities in 2019 with people visiting 10.5 times over the course of the year, um, followed by the movies at 5.3 times. But here in Simsbury, the per capita visits to our library were 14.8 per capita last year. Wow. The state average is only about 5.3. Wow. I can also let you know that over 50% of the population in town does have a library card. Um, the state average is about 40%. So, okay, moving into the budget. Our total proposed operating budget is $1,670,632, an increase of $54,577, or 3.37%. $631,138 is for the administration, an increase of 3.16%. For adult services, we have an increase of $540,367, or 1.94%. Children's services, an increase of $354,666, or 3.45%. And then building and grounds, $144,460, or 9.98%. And you'll see later on in the slides the building and grounds trends that have increased the, that portion of the budget. We have 23.23 budgeted full-time equivalents. Um, the majority of them are in the administration section, followed by adults followed by children's services and then adult services. And basically that's because adult services primarily part-time staff. I can tell you that the library benefited about $115,000 last year by using volunteer service hours. They provided over 3,700 hours last year, which is a tremendous support to the staff. 
What we haven't done in the past, we haven't highlighted for you the support that the Friends of the Simsbury Public Library actually provides the library every year. This about $70,000 really is the annual support almost annually that we receive from the Friends of the Library. So it's over and above what the town provides. And certainly we couldn't do what we do without this support. But the key here is that it's not guaranteed support. It's not necessarily sustainable support. But I did want to point out to you that this is about how much we do see. And of course, they fund other special projects as well. Uh, this year, they'll be funding the Story Walk that we hope to have a ribbon cutting for in May. Could you, real quick, sure. go back um, to that slide. So if um, if we lost their support, and it should have been very, very uh, black and white in the sense, was it, we talk about the progr programs, or is it too simplistic to say programs are events that are held and run in, at, it, it, where people come to experience at the library, right? You would see not a tremendous decrease in programming program. at all levels, yes. Yeah. And that is, um, and then what would be an idea, I, I know you're going to probably give us your percentage at some point, and when you're, when your fantastic stats about Hopefully. spending on materials, <laughs> the, the material, what is that material there? Is it simplistically a book? Potentially, no. They, they provide funds for DVDs. Uh, they provide funds for streaming material, for digital content, for large print material, for teen services. So part material. of that is the product that's on the shelves. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. There, right. It's not absolutely. materials related to the programs that are being no, added it's there. No, material that circulates. Really, okay. Yes. That's important for people, I think. Mm -hmm. to yes. Know mm -hmm. that part as well. All right. Thank you. Sure. So our services and programs, and this is a very high level of what we do, we educate and enrich the community by providing free and equal access to information. And I think we, we hit on that free and equal access um, point when we went find free with our pilot last July. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk more about that later. And we serve as the community's multi-generational gathering place. I think we are one of the places in town, in addition to parks and recreation, where there's something for everyone from birth until, until people are seniors. Mm -hmm. And we offer hands-on learning and, of course, volunteer opportunities that I already touched on. We're also a community partner. We partner with almost all of uh, the other town departments, as well as the schools and local businesses and organizations, and, of course, other area libraries so that we can leverage what we have. And then, of course, we actively support economic development through the Business Resource Center. And uh, as you know, we've just hired a new Business Resource Center coordinator who has really hit the ground running, and he's got great ideas and a lot of energy. Through our Innovators Workshop, we provide equipment and collaborative workspace and learning opportunities for all kinds of different people and all ages of people. And um, over the course of the opening of the Makerspace in 2014, usage has increased over 66%. Um, we provide a safe place for teens um, to engage in quiet study, to socialize, and of course opportunities to gain vital leadership opportunities through our teen advisory board. And then through our, um, through our teen job center that we won the Connecticut Library Association Excellence in Public Library Service Award, um, we provide them the workforce skills that they need to be successful. Okay. Um, as you know, we completed our renovation of the lower level this year and added an 80-seat program space, and that was funded in part by a grant from the state of Connecticut. It was a desperately needed space the, the, um, through our strategic planning process, we, and we also knew that we were running out of space for all of the organizations and for town government to use within the library, as well as library programming. Um, we know that last year we had 49 outside programs at the library a week in addition to the 30 library programs that we were doing every week. So that's a lot of demand on, on a space that's finite. We did become a certified passport acceptance agency. I can tell you that um, the start of that rollout has gone very slowly. Um, we're not allowed to offer renewals of passports, which is part of the issue. And I think someone else who presented earlier said this is a very well-traveled community. Many people already have passports. But we have seen in the last month that it is picking up. So will will that eventual will you eventually be able to do renewals or is that just not going to? It's happen? a it's a federal statute, federal. so probably okay. not. Isn't there more exposure in the new than the renewal? Hmm? Isn't it more hazardous to do new passports than renewal? Hmm. I don't know what to tell you. It's yeah. a federal statute. <laughs> <laughs> 
but it is something that we will maintain and staff will need to be trained annually to upkeep this this process i do think for families it's a it's a very valuable place that you can go to the library where it's comfortable and you can instead of standing at the post office at the counter i know i just want to renew my passport at the library sorry <laughs> if you want to early enough you can do it online when we, when we went you guys didn't have the applications uh, and, and then it went like this, everybody going, going uh, <laughs> where, where are the application stored? And nobody knew where they were. But I think it's That's an they, unfortunate thing to hear right now. But I think it's because <laughs> they were out of them. Hmm? That's a good, I think it's because they were out of them. It's a good oh, thing. So. Okay. <laughs> All right. And then, um, of course, we initiated our fine free um, pilot, too. And you'll see the impact that that is have in a further slide. Areas of focus for next year. For the past couple of years, we've been focusing a lot of on outreach and meeting people where they are. It's time to bring it back into the building and increase engagement within the facility. So we're going to increase our library card holders by 2%, increase program attendance by 2%, and increase material circulation by 1.5%. And of course, we're going to continue to invest in the development of the library staff. If you look at our budget overall, the majority of it is personnel because we are people-based service over 64 hours across, across a week. Um, so we're going to continue to cross-train people so we're more flexible and more dynamic. Um, we're going to offer at least one staff development program. Thanks to uh, the town manager, we were able to offer for the very first time a staff development opportunity for our full-time staff. And I've already seen the benefits to that. Um, just in building the team dynamic, we better understand each other. Um, and thanks to the chief and the police department, we were able to offer um, a security training for our staff as well. And then um, Rachel Gravel, who's head of borrowing and technical services, she's working on a staff intranet for us so that people will have one-stop shopping at their desktops or their laptops to find the critical information they need to work. Another area of focus is supporting uh, the local economy through our library programs, materials and services, and the Business Resource Center. Um, you already know that we applied for a Peg Pisha grant to increase the um, equipment and expand the equipment that we have in Innovators Workshop. And hopefully we'll hear about that soon. Um, we are going to work with the Business Resource Center coordinator to support economic development in their work plan by creating a co-working space in the Business Resource Center. Now that's exactly how it was designed when it started 20 years ago, but it needs a refresh because co-working is much different now than it was 20 years ago. We've already had um, started implementing a short-term plan to do that. We've moved power grommets to the top of the tables rather than having people crawl under the table, <laughs> life transforming. Um, and we're looking at to uh, add additional seating, additional co-working areas, and the Business Resource Center coordinator is actually giving up his office to accommodate another meeting area. Cool. And the Business Resource Center coordinator, he's already been working with the Econo Economic Development mm -hmm. Commission and Melissa to support them. So the budget highlights, $29,519 increase in full-time salaries due to general wage increases and step increases. Um, you'll see that the library workforce when I first arrived six years ago was very seasoned and what we've seen in the past six years is the turnover of the seasoned employees and we're bringing on new staff so you're going to see an increase in step increases for a while. And then of course the increase in minimum wage is impacting the library because we have many many people that are working minimum wage, many many, a handful, um, but it's $6,300 which is not an insignificant impact on the budget. <clears throat> And then we have an extended duration of warm weather, so that increases our electricity because of the air conditioning. Help me out with that. That's the only building in town that experienced that. Uh, this building as well. Um, There's no 16% increase in electricity budgets in Eno and any of the other budgets. We're also open more often than town hall is. 16% is gigantic, though. That's... Are we sure that's what's going on? It was that's really hot last and, summer, wasn't it? It was, it was yeah, warm it was for a though. long time. Yeah. It was warm way into the fall. I understand that. We've had years where it's been warm into the fall before. Right. I'm confused. Yeah, that's a massive change. Uh, really in, so, in some of our buildings, um, yeah, the warm season was like exceptionally long this year. Um, and some of our buildings um, don't have central air systems. Um, and some of them have just a handful of window units. So in terms of, and shorter times that they're open. So the two buildings that were really impacted from electricity perspective um, were this building in particular and the library. It's sort of a combination of those factors with, again, central air, mm -hmm. longer warm season. We, we tend to be open longer than most of our buildings. I'd like to dive more into that. So that's, sure. a, that's a massive increase. So it's something we can certainly look at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. New HVAC 
new central air? You guys have been doing upgrades, so I'm wondering if we that's... Have, we actually do not have one central air unit. We have multiple mm -hmm. air units, which could mm -hmm. also be why it's not as cost, cost effective. effective. I know. They, but they, if they're just, newer, that would drive the cost down. They've just been changing up. over, so I'm saying I'm wondering if they weren't as effective. But then this budget should be down, not up. If they're more effective going forward, then the cost should be lower. The last cent the last air unit that went in was 2012. Yeah. And mm -hmm. of course, the the um, renovated space downstairs has a new HVAC That's what it was. Mm -hmm. unit. Yeah. Yeah. I just. Let's, it's let's, something we can let's, certainly yeah, look into because like that 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 really is an outlier, especially with the technology we have and everything else to to cut that back. And of course, you know, we have a new generator at the library, which is a wonderful thing to have should the power go out for an extended period, um, because we know that people will flock to charge their electronic devices, yeah. blow dry their hair, check up on all their Wi-Fi. <laughs> um, but that does come with increased cost to the budget. So we have $1,200 for um, the annual testing of the oil tank. And then um, we also need additional de-icing for our um, walkways and parking lot. And then we need $500 to provide the oil for the generator. So for, for, remind, for you just, but just because you brought up construction, um, remind me what was sort of been sort of an ongoing out front to the right corner, externally. The HVAC the system. That was, but there was like repeated excavation and then back in. And the generator the went in, and also yep. the HVAC system okay. for the new tariff room is there. Is that? It, but it was seemingly that was recent though too. Like there was some well past, well past. Yes, the, the there was a problem room with being, the oil tank, so they okay. were excavating the front lawn again. Okay. very right. recently. Thank yes. you. That's what it was. That's been remedied. Well past the completion of that. Oh project. yes, and that's all done tank. now. Yeah, it There's should be. Yes, it's going. been corrected. Okay. So I wanted to um, demonstrate for you, illustrate today, how the fine free pilot has impacted our fine revenue. Um, you'll see in fiscal year 18, um, we were operating just as we had been all along and we brought in about $27,000 in fines and we instituted automatic renewal in 2019, which is something that the library consortium actually instituted as well. Um, and it, it brought fine revenue down because people's material was automatically renewed. And I can tell you anecdotally, especially parents love that service because mm -hmm. if you have 50,000 children's books and it's very hard to keep track of them, they automatically get renewed. You automatically buy yourself some extra time. And then if you look at the fine free pilot now that we're almost all the way through this year, um, you can see it didn't really impact the revenue from fines as much as we may have thought. And the reason for that is we have self-check machines. And so people that visit Simsbury Library and need to check material out may have fines from other libraries, and they pay those fines at the self-check machine, so we bring in that revenue. Oh, that's strange. All right, why don't we get that revenue? <coughs> so. We have to remit it to the library? We do not. Is that somewhat huh. because of okay. the fact that we, have a, we do have a we do have a pool we have a shared pool of materials right is that is that somewhat behind that methodology or thinking not necessarily no i think so we get what to we, keep there, what we, we find here in simsbury we have such a robust vibrant library that yeah. people from surrounding towns use us more frequently than they might our yeah. people going somewhere else so that that's why you see okay. that as so i know we can like electronically you can pull Yes, you can a copy of it from holes, somebody yes. else. So I just wonder if that's behind the methodology of sharing the fines as well. Because no, because if they pull material agreement. from another library and pick it up here in Simsbury and check it out here, it will not accrue a fine. Okay. So it's material they've checked out through other libraries, but then they visit Simsbury to check something out and they have a fine. Mm -hmm. We should have a special day where we yeah. encourage Avon residents to come to our <laughs> library. <laughs> we'll call it Avon Day. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean. So we're scheduled to do a full presentation on the fine free pilot in May to the Board of Selectmen. All right, trends and challenges. Obviously, we're going to continue to provide the services that we do provide in the most cost effective, efficient manner as possible. Um, circulation of materials and community engagement, of course, at a public service desk is really the core of library service still. And then, of course, we continually evaluate what we're doing to make sure that it's cost effective and relevant, in fact. 
So as I've told you, we opened the new tariff fill room. You know that it allevi alleviated some of the demand for our spaces, but we still continually shuffle groups around to make sure that we can accommodate people. So we are continually looking at different ways that we can use our space and increasing the business resource center's flexibility to be a co-working space will help with some of that. The business resource center coordinator giving up his office to become another conference room, also mm -hmm. part of that. And just as the other departments, we continue to monitor state funding um, to see how it might impact the library budget. Right now, the uh, borrow it funds are in the budget, so we're not concerned about it for this year, but going down the road, we don't know if that $19,000 will be coming directly to us in perpetuity or not, so it is something that we continue to track. And I talked about this last year as well, but the State Library restructured its Deliverit program. And what it has caused is that the library consortium now has to do a hybrid delivery service. So we have supplemental delivery from our library consortium on top of the state library delivery service. That's not adequate to support Simsbury's needs because we're a high volume library. Currently, the library consortium is paying reserve funds to support that transit bill. Eventually, that's not sustainable and the cost will come back to the library. So that is something that we continue to monitor. Okay, on to my service improvement. <laughs> um, and I brought props. <laughs> so while library services have changed greatly in the last 10 to 20 years, circulation and the borrowing of materials is still a core service. And the town has invested so heavily in the infrastructure in the library, and that's great and it's wonderful, but if you continue to invest in the infrastructure of the library and you don't invest in the collection, eventually you're going to wind up with a shell. The other thing that's changed over the course of these past 10 years when you can see the materials budget has dipped and never really recovered. Um, in 2008, when we were up at about $175,000, $180,000, there was not the demand or the need necessarily for the same digital content that you need today. So while in the past we could have purchased one copy of the book, we now need to purchase an audio copy of the book. We now need to purchase an e-book. And then, of course, keeping in mind that there are some people who are vision impaired, we have a large print copy. Should this book become a movie, then we'll need to purchase the DVD. So you're not just purchasing one title, one copy, one volume. You're purchasing multiples. Is this inclusive of the, the gift from the friends? It is not. It is not. So it what does that trend look like when you overlay that? Um, it's not very. It's not very different. So that it's been consistent. The friends have been given 40k even back in the higher funding times? I think the material contribution's only about 19. Yeah, it's I'm sorry, I thought it, I, okay, no, my mistake. Yeah, it's about 19, okay. 19 or 20. Yeah. yeah, it's about 19 or 20, and that has okay. been consistent. But again, the, the key thing that I want to remind everyone about the friend's income, it's not guaranteed. Mm -hmm. Anything could happen. A lot of the friend's income is contingent upon membership, mm -hmm. and we know across all kinds of organizations mm -hmm. that membership is dropping. Right. Um, another thing that their income is built on is the income from the book sale. And they've already sort of been planning for, you know, people buying ebooks rather than physical books, the drop off of donations for the book sale. So again, that's not guaranteed income. So while you're pointing to that, the fact that they support the material budget, it's not something that we, we can necessarily count on. No, I was just, I was worried that it was actually, the drop was actually worse and that they had increased no. there to, to no. slow it down. No. Okay. Can you talk about the grant that the library just applied for? The Pegpecia grant? I'm not sure, and I thought it was for some materials and audiobooks. It was, um, the, that portion of the Pegpecia grant was for things in the children's department. They're actually um, self-contained read-along books. When, when, when I was young, you had a, uh, a record on your record player, and it would ding when you needed to turn the page. Now it's all complete in one unit, and that's, it was to fund um, an opening collection of that material. That was part of it, yes. But again, grant funding is not something that you can rely on to sure. have to support your material budget. Neither is taxpayer dollars is the problem. But neither is great claims years. So yeah. then I, I wanted to show you where we fall expenditure per capita wise for materials. You'll see that Avon is there with $9.37 and we are down at the end with $6.41. And no, that does not contain the friend's support for the materials because it's not guaranteed income. So what we've requested uh, is an additional $20,000, which will bring the per capita, um, per capita, restoring that to the 2008 levels, will bring the per capita spending to $7.38. So we'll be right there between Glastonbury and West Hartford, 
should you should you grant that request and just because that's not in these budget pages correct so okay. there were um if you'll recall from my presentation a few weeks ago, there were four uh, service improvements that I felt uh, really rose to the top in terms of an organizational priority and the event that the board wants to um, add to the budget. I um, mm -hmm. felt that that was a policy decision. So later in the afternoon, we do have a summary of these four flagged uh, potential service improvements or restorations um, for discussion to see if you would want to add them to the budget. I did, um, for the purposes of today, characterize um, the library's material request as a restoration um, only because, again, their funding is still you know well below where it previously had been um, but it's sort of in that same category of improvement or restoration so, so we'll be I, talking about it more this afternoon I'd want to see that though with all in costs because you're just spiking out one line item so what was the funding when it was changed for the entire library versus what is it is now so you're saying it's a cut but was what's mm -hmm. the funding for the library in its entirety back then versus it is now oh I'm sorry we were, yeah we were just focused on the materials yeah then. I mean that's yeah that's difficult I mean, it, Sean's point you need a full comparison if you're going to yeah. do that is did we fund more positions? Have we have we gone a different direction? To, it's I mean, we added different programming, which is all none of it. It's a defense. It's just no. it's a it's a it's just a more global understanding of the request and how it fits in. Yes, because it, um, so when you when you I don't know if at least we we will be here later on to add the more narrative to that that point of material cost, but is it something as simplistic as books on shelves in their various for forms or are there other materials that would be in there I mean it um, is part of the request as well primarily it's circulating materials like books like DVDs right. like audio books like books on CD okay. digital so I shouldn't content. I, I, databases are also in there okay mm -hmm. so I shouldn't think about uh, get any of the any of the learning games that are there or uh, Office supplies, materials, and all. No, simply, not office okay. supplies for yeah, sure. Right. Perhaps some of the games that we do circulate now, the um, the material the library of things actually was purchased with friends funds. And to speak to your to your question and comment, Sean, I think um, since 2008, in 2012, the library budget was actually cut and hours were cut. Yeah, but then we put them back. You did put them back. Yes, we have not added any significant staff in that time. Um, when we hired our teen services librarian, it was through money that we had through attrition. So it's not like we added any additional staff positions. Also during this tenure, the secretary position was cut to part time. Um, that's since been reinstated, but it's still not at full time. So I wouldn't say that the library budget is any, any significantly different due to programming or changes in service. No, but it, I mean, it is up on annual Compression. I mean, we, we have rising costs every year. That's right. Um, Marianne just reminded me that the, the expanded library in the structure that it's in now, the 43,000 square feet, opened yeah. in 2009. Look, I'm not against it. I just, when, if we're going to make the argument to the Board of Finance, we sure. need to do apples and apples because I, I guarantee my friend Lisa is going to ask me that yep. question. Mm -hmm. Yep. So. Any other questions? Oh, in general, I have I didn't yeah. know if you were done or on that. I just um, I, on the on the revenue. So we get money when people rent out the the program space. Is we get money when for-profit people rent out the program spaces. Okay. Not for profits are not charged. So because just the question came up recently. So the NAACP came. Mm -hmm. They use the Terrafell room. Mm -hmm. um, then we have like Community for Care. Mm -hmm. They use the the room, and then mm -hmm. you have the internal things the question came up is who advertises those I like and this may not be related but who is responsible for getting the word out since it's held at the library do you guys take ownership of that or should the agency we don't have the staff it? capacity okay. to take ownership of outside groups using the library yeah. if it's a if it's a program that we're partnering with an organization okay. then we would promote that for sure okay because it just came up and we, I didn't know the answer and so we get asked that very frequently and yeah. unfortunately we do not have the staff capacity okay but to it's do good that. to know in yes. advance then sure. they can yes. go do their own thing or get we do help. promote the friends program because it's, it's a yeah. partnership yeah okay Thanks. can you, can you sure. just go back to the chart just for a second on the reference material oh so my I'm, goodness what did I do <laughs> 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 I just want to be because I'm gonna forget oh, later I got it. we're gonna talk about this at the end this of the day or uh, that one. So we're at yeah one six so we're at one sixty four two hundred and we yes. want to go to one eighty four two hundred one eighty five. Yes. Oh, okay. I just want to make sure I understood. One eighty five k. Any other questions for Lisa? Sorry, I will totally forget in three hours. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you
I'd be happy to remind you. Well, I didn't want to, you don't need to stay. <laughs> uh, I was trying to save you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. I also want to thank the members of the uh, library board and the friends who are here. Which it's I should a, have done, I'm very sorry. Oh, no <laughs> Is this such a partnership and, and, um, and uh, it's a gem in our town. Mm -hmm. It, it wouldn't exist without that partnership, so thank you. Let Tom go quick. Let's do Tom. All right. I'm going to hold you that. <laughs> <coughs> I don't this one's going to be easy. I no, don't you know can't if have I'm it. more generous <laughs> when I'm positive. <laughs> this one's easy. We're going flat. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding, Dave. Jeez. <laughs> Uh, we're going to need some help with the sprinklers. All right. Our friends at the next board. Uh, All right, good afternoon, everyone. Good. I think everybody good knows me because I'm here every week. <laughs> so, Hi, Tom. We'll forgo that. I want to thank uh, Jerry Wetchin and Dave Bush from the Recreation Commission for coming, and Mike Wallace, my. Uh, Simsbury Farms Golf Superintendent and Orlando Casiano, our Park Superintendent, are in attendance as well. Um, yes. <laughs> Coming in. So here we go. Culture Parks and Recreation budget. Um, this year, the total operating expense budget is three million one hundred sixty-seven thousand five hundred eighty-eight dollars. Um, the two big and, I'll, and it's broken down by division. There, the two largest budget drivers within that three million are the minimum wage increase. Um, for our lifeguards, our camp counselors, our parks maintenance staff, and uh, tree maintenance. Uh, as you know, it's becoming, it's becoming almost epidemic in this part of the state. Um, so those are the two biggest drivers, the, the roughly over 30,000 for minimum wage and 30,000 in tree maintenance. So those are trees different than what Tom Rice crew does? Yes. Different. These are parks and open space trees, trail trees. Um, okay. And those aren't included in the, in the extra spend that we had for the Emerald Ash Board? Right, that was roadway. That was all Why didn't we include those? That's a good question. <laughs> that that is a well, that is a great question. At the staff level, we have talked about. It. Unfortunately, both Tom and myself, we weren't here when the ash borer study was um, completed. Um, yeah, I, but we funded it last year and the year, year before. Right, right. So that that was the study that was done on the ash borer trees in our roadways. And I understand when the study was done, but the yeah. funding was last year and the year before. So we paid and for it while everybody was here. Current year, yeah. right, yeah. right. So there was a study to do. Um, there was a study that identified all the ash borers that needed to be removed along the roadway. Right. And that's what that CNR project has been for, which was right. to remove um, them from the roadway. Why the park and open space trees weren't included in that study, um, we can't really speak to. Um, but it is something we're now trying to catch up on, is trying to take care of um, the dead and diseased trees in our, in our parks and open space. There hasn't been, I mean, uh, from my experience here, and, and, and you would, Tom, Sean, you've been around a long time, there hasn't been a, an increase to the parks maintenance budget to cover tree maintenance in many, many, many years. And as we brought these new parks online and brought these trails online, the trees have aged. They become more active. They're more heavily used. They're, they're, there's more of a, an expectation if you know, somebody's calling when when things are looking like they need to come down or there's a, in danger. Um, also, our residents in town are more aware of open who who about open space are more aware of trees coming down on their property. So we're we're constantly going out on calls, having to look at trees, uh, many of which we're we're having to take down or, or maintain in some way. No, and I get that. I guess my frustration is that we we pitched to the Board of Finance rather forcefully and we got pushed back on this topic and now we got to go to them again a third time for even more money and that's that's not going to go over well. Understood. And it's not your fault but it, it's this is where we need to be looking at this stuff in totality. So let's make sure that we've got it all in this time because this is not going to be well received when we go up there. Mm -hmm. It's not going to stop. No. It, it, and, that, and that's, that's it. I mean yeah. we, we asked for you know we're asking for an increase of 30,000. That's probably a th about half of what we really need to, to do the job um, and then start start and doing preventive maintenance that's this is start. this is just yeah. reactive maintenance right. yeah right. right yeah so again we need to talk about this and then if we put it in the budget it never comes out so do we need to do this in a CNR one-time item so that people understand that this is extraordinary to get us caught up 
So the particular money that we're looking for in the operating budget for Park and Rec, I would not necessarily characterize as the extraordinary. Um, as Tom said, a lot of it is reactive now, but in terms of looking ahead and just in terms of having adequate funds for the parks and open space parcels for tree maintenance, um, that was why we proposed it as an operating expense because um, we don't really see an end to having to do tree maintenance within our parks and open space um, versus the project along the roadways is a little different. Um, but again, I think we're just going to have that continual tree maintenance and, and the parks and open space. So I got to push there. Though, there though. If, these, if these are the emerald ash borers, they're all going to die. Eventually. It, oh, this isn't exclusive to ash borers. It's not just that. Yeah, it's not just ash borers. A lot of parks. older oaks and maples. Everything. I mean, yeah. Belden Forest is not is not all ash trees. You're not right. supposed to be cutting anything in there. Right. But it's we an have old to, growth forest. But if we have a hangar over a trail, we have to. We have. We're right. obligated. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're telling people to go hike there, we are obligated to make sure that trail is safe. So you're telling me there's the bike trail. There's 30 grand in an increase in in hangers on a year over year basis. We have. Sean, let me answer that. Yeah. It's not just hangers. It's just preventive maintenance. You know, we, we, the 2011 storm did major damage to all of our parks and open space areas. Yeah. So we're constantly, we're still sort of recovering from that 2011 storm. So we're doing tree, tree takedowns due to age, which is one of the biggest factors. Okay. I mean, we have. So could that be sort of, like, so if you looked on just tree, if, so if a tree came across the path, the Emmett path, would that fall in? Would, so I, maybe, Mike, I don't know, you can help understand. So if a tree comes down, during a storm across the, the path, and you send out some, you, one of your, your teams gets deferred from cutting a green that morning to go clean up that tree and remove it. Is that just sort of all part and parcel of the labor that's spent for that day, just a daily job, or do you guys actually look at it like we've got a, we've got a price for this and, and pay for it out of a different fund? Can you help me understand that? It, it's depending on the tree. And I'll list this contract on work where we can get to in between property lines that we need a chipper, a claim, mm -hmm. a professional climber to go up there and take down these trees. Obviously a lot more expensive. Uh, anything that's down, we clean up ourselves, but it's more for contractional work that's being done by contractors. Yeah, especially. We have a lot of tree in the Meadow Farms neighborhood with the open space trails that, that intersect between the neighborhood. That, that neighborhood is now close to 40, 50 years old. There's a lot of trees that are in danger of coming down on, on ho open space trees on homeowners' property or onto those trails. There, there's thousands of dollars worth of tree work just in that neighborhood alone that we yeah, need we, to address. We have over at Mount Farms have uh, about ten thousand dollars worth of work that has to get done due to tree damage, age, and right. from, from so on. Look, I'm not to be. You guys are the experts on it. I guess my point is, is instead, and I don't want to do this every year where we have a debate about trees and then we got to go with hat in hand to the Board of Finance. If there's a couple hundred thousand dollars of tree work, let's talk about it. Let's get it down on a piece of paper. Let's fund it because, again, when this thing, when this stuff comes out of left field a little bit, it makes it harder to deal with on the budgetary side. So let's get these numbers to the right place so that we can take care of all the damage, and we can understand what's truly the operating budget impact, the maintenance, the the ongoing stuff. Versus we've got to go back and fix ten years of we haven't been paying attention. And again, not a knock on anybody, but we haven't been funding that. So. Those to me are two different things, and let's 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 just get those numbers down there so we can arm you guys with the right amount of funds and get those trails cleaned up. And, and the hope is, Sean, is to get to to that point where we can do preventive maintenance. Yes. And prevent these numbers from being continued to. Yeah. Grow. Let's, so that, let's that's the goal. let's talk about what what that number is so that we all do it with eyes wide open. Because again, what I know are my friends on the board of finance don't like is that we tell them it's a number one year, and then we didn't tell them about the next two years that are coming. And they get pretty frustrated with us, and rightfully so. So let's just make sure that we understand the full impact. Because we broke the emerald ash borer issue up into multiple Two, years because yes. we didn't want to we didn't want to deal with it all at once. So again, that's fine that this is different, but let's let's try to handle it the same way. With if, if there's really three hundred thousand dollars worth of work here, let's put that down and figure out in our list of priorities, are we gonna spend that three hundred now or are we gonna spend it over three years or five years or whatever we're gonna do? And to Tom, hopefully that gives you better certainty, so you're not having to come in here and fight for this every year in your operating yeah. budget. So, thanks, guys. Sorry for going down that rabbit hole, right. but trees are expensive. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. <clears throat> the uh, the Culture Parks and Recreation Department, uh, between the parks, golf, and uh, recreation side, uh, we're at 18 full-time uh, employees right now. Uh, we were at 19 last year. We had the position, the recreation supervisor, one of the two recreation supervisor positions. Um, Re, uh, reduced in last year's budget. Um, on the golf, the, the, just to note here, on the golf full-time FTEs, we have four full-time employees. We have a superintendent, assistant, assistant superintendent, a mechanic, and a maintainer. Uh, we have four part-time, uh, seasonal part-time employees, 
during the golf season, that adds up to the other two full-time employees. That's the, the note there. Uh, we are currently maintaining 535 acres of park and 2,500 acres of open space and certainly many, many, many miles of trails. And we will be taking on the, um, the new Hopbrook Landing at the Flower Bridge Park coming on this spring. Um, certainly there's going to be a higher level of maintenance there. There's a lot of hand mowing going, that's going to be needed at that park. Um, we are working in uh, conjunction with the uh, Flower Bridge Committee to use their volunteer efforts to help us with the flower, the, the flower beds there, and we're very grateful for their efforts in that uh, department. So areas of focus this year, we're hoping to increase, uh, it, continually, this is every year, increase participation and awareness of our department programs and events. We're hoping to get, you know, continued use of social marketing tools that, that we have available to us. Uh, we're trying to work with our, with our staff and other town departments to uh, integrate our events and our activities so we're all share, we are kind of all sharing the load. Uh, I know the library and social services and, and the recreation department have been very good about uh, coordinating events together. Uh, and I know we'll be continuing to do so through this year. Um, as the master plan, you're going to get your master plan presentation at the end of uh, April. We're going to be taking those recommendations and working and begin working through those over the next 10 years. Uh, so you'll see some of some of the initial um, ideas that are going to be presented. We we do have in this budget, but we'll be con we'll be concentrating on those as we move forward. Uh, we're going to be adding adult, uh, more adult and more preschool programs to what we already offer, um, and hopefully getting into some more after school programs. And one of the things that we're really hoping to do is is really trying to create an awareness about the parks and trails and open space that we do have in town. One of the, one of the ideas I have is it's called a gnome, gnome your parks program. So I think we're going to purchase some gnomes and, <laughs> and have, you know, we'll write, kind of do this uh, uh, Facebook type of thing where people will go to the park, find a gnome and, and, ha and hashtag Simsbury Rec and what park it is. Um, and then, you know, if enough people, do, you know, if people at one park do it, we'll, we'll draw a gift certificate or something, trying to, trying to get really people to go and look for these things. Um, yeah, I'm kind of tagging that off some, something I've seen another community do, but I think it'll work here. Um, and again, we're going to be concentrating a lot on our fence, on our uh, trail fencing and the trees in our trails and parks, as we mentioned before. There's our minimum wage increase uh, this year. And again, that's across all of our, all of our divisions in the recreation department, our $30,000 increase request for the tree maintenance. Um, and again, it's climate, age, and tree disease are all contributing to those, to those things. Um, while we're asking for that request. Yeah, Tom, I'll just quickly jump mm -hmm. in here. Sorry, since we're a little, little out of order with um, our slides and discussion. But I think I had mentioned in the presentation, just in comparison right now for an operating budget, we only had $10,000 budget, budgeted a year um, to take care of all of our open space and parks for trees. And um, comparatively, we had 55000 budgeted on an annual basis for tree work and our roadways. Um, and when we, as Tom mentioned, um, we've been starting to get the results of the parks and, and open space master plan. And that was one of the areas that they've identified is um, you know us needing to make more of an investment in terms of the maintenance aspect of the parks and, and the open space. So <clears throat> a lot of that contributed to us identifying identifying this need. Yeah, it is. I mean, <clears throat> as we've talked about and we're going to talk about later in capital, I mean, this town loves to buy open space, which is a good thing, but, but the taxpayers don't like to find the, fund the maintenance of it, so mm -hmm. we need to do a better job of that. Exactly. Because we're asking, you know, and they don't understand is there's an operating budget you know, long since at the, at the Walker bond issue passes, we still got to pay for that land. Yeah. And, and, uh, our, I mean, our guys aren't just, I mean, they're not just mowing and no, planting no. fields. We're, we're, do, we're doing all, ki all kinds of things. You guys do everything. Um, it's crazy. A, a couple, I was going to share an interesting story. We had a report last year from a cross-country skier about a uh, oh, yeah. uh, potential stalker, homeless person uh, setting up shop in Ethel Walker Woods. As it turned out, we did, Orlando and I went out kids. there. What's that? <laughs> no, <I'm sorry. laughs> we, we, we went out there, you know, we, we were able to get a general idea where what, what we were looking for, and about 50 to 100 yards off the trail, in a, deep in the woods, um, someone had built a tree fort about 15 feet high and wow. roughly about the size of a small living room using windows and old doors, and it was four sides. It had a roof, yeah. floor, everything. And... Um, it looked like somebody <laughs> had been living there. As it turns out, we think it's some high school kids yeah. who had taken up shop out there and, and <laughs> using it as a hangout spot. But it, it come springtime, it took roughly three to four people yeah, three, three days, days to dismantle this this tree fort and get it out of the you know walk the equipment walk the the wow. debris out of the woods. Oh, 
Gosh. So. <laughs> I'm not that handy. So. <laughs> it, it took some time. It took some time to get it up. It took some time to take it down. Trust me. We, our, we, we, we're constant. I mean, I think we're, we're our customer service is great, especially on the parks, and we're reacting to calls every day about this or that, or someone sees something in a park, and, and I think everybody, the satisfaction levels coming back from the survey were, were fantastic. People really see that, you know, we're out there making an effort. We're doing our best to keep these, <coughs> these spaces clean and, and safe for everyone. Uh, but it's not just the, the the lining of the fields or mowing where most they're most yeah. commonly seen. It's it's I, soup to nuts out there. I get it. You guys are working hard. So um, there is an increase this year for uh, sewer and water charges. Um, we've been underfunded in that account as as uh, the pool meters uh, pool meter has come online at Memorial Park. Uh, that's raised our that's not raised our rates. Uh, the the sewer. Um, treatment plan has been giving us a break on the sewer charges the last couple of years and that unfortunately we can't guarantee that's going to be able to happen again this year um, and the so cost, does that of, mean? That the means cost we, of water has increased so. so that means that we haven't been charged right for the water in the past and now we got any up to it I, I think that's probably the case from what I've seen we've got we've seen our um, and now we've got after a year of being here we've got a better handle on on what that account looks like and this is a more realistic uh, the 10,000 increase is a more realistic um, expectation of that expense and is that tied to the again the age of and challenges we already have at Memorial Pool a, a large part of that mm -hmm. is yes mm -hmm. yep. that's part of that okay yeah. that, that would be fair to say another reason why a splash pad might be a bad idea a good idea, a good idea. Addition, bad idea water charges uh, it all goes down the drain once it, it goes it, up in the air there are recycling it's options with splash pads mm -hmm. evaporation too yeah, yeah there's recycling we options so between the insurance increase yeah. and that okay on the but <laughs> to, to your point about the insurance before a, a splash pad is less insurance than a pool so yeah, yeah less staff too. right up until the first kid gets hurt He's selling this <laughs> <laughs> all right continuing with our budget highlights here <laughs> Uh, this budget maintains the current level of services, um, recognizing that, we're, that there's still work to be done on the special revenue fund, um, which the, the Board of Selectmen has, has signed on to the work group that they'll be working through this spring and summer on that project. Um, and the town manager is recommending a $25,000 increase from the, to the general fund contribution to this, from the general fund to the special revenue fund this year. Um, and then the $5,000 reallocation that was mentioned before from the senior center budget uh, to fund our community events going forward. Like, like movie night and conference. Movie, yeah, conference yeah, actually, yeah, there's a, like a couple of slides coming up. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, right. You're stealing my thunder. I'm just really excited. <laughs> here we go. Wait, so. Hold on, Tom, though. Before yep. we do that, we do need to warn our Board of Finance friends that we have not yet finished that work, and we talked about that we extensively about during year. the budget process. Yeah. yeah, we were and supposed to be ahead of that. So we apologize, but given all the priorities we've had this year, that, yeah. that one didn't make it yet. We, we, but we all know you guys how busy. No, and you guys, too. It's, it, there's a lot of folks that need to bring in, and we wanted to do that right. So it's not been ignored, um, but we haven't been able to prioritize it yet to get it in. So I know there was a meeting that went out recently, right, on that? Yep. Yeah. So no, We appreciate the support yes. that, that uh, so again, everybody's thinking about this. Folks on the Board of Finance, we're being transparent. We're going to get to it, we promise. So that $5,000 um, reallocation from the Senior Center uh, General Fund budget, uh, we're, we're, we're reallocating that. We have done a service improvement the last two years for more community special events. We really think this is the, the best way to engage our residents. Uh, again, increasing civic pride. Um, and we also do this as a collaboration between, again, the police department, so, uh, town, uh, public works, the library, social services. We're all in this together. And you know, as the recreation department, as the coordinator of these things, um, I think we're, I'm, I'm good at that. We're, we, have a, we have the infrastructure in place, and when everybody else comes in and partners with us, we can do some really great things. Um, some of the ideas that we're looking at, and again, my friends at the Sims Ray Meadows, too, we're, we're partnering with them. Uh, free summer concerts, we're looking at two or three concerts per, per summer um, at the Meadows and using their infrastructure, the restrooms and the snack concession setups, and, and we're, we'll be bringing in the entertainment. Uh, spring egg hunt, uh, spring and fall movie nights, at, down there, uh, we did the fall movie night last year, which was very, very popular. Um, people are already asking about which what, what our dates are going to be for this year. Um, summer neighborhood block parties. What my thought is for this is that each summer we would have a crew of rec volunteers that would go to the different neighborhoods in town: the Terrafield Green, um, Squadron Line, maybe West Mountain Park, uh, Weetog Park, or or in that neighborhood. <laughs> And we would just go just a couple of hours for a, a free night of entertainment for family for families uh, to come out and hang out. We maybe have some food trucks show up, some inflatables. The rec personnel would run some games. We'd certainly get the word out about our programs. Maybe have a DJ there. 
Um, but just to, just a relaxed night, people to, for them to hang out uh, with, with their, their friends and people to see each other over the summer. Um, we're hopefully going to be doing something on the Terrafield Green and partnering with the, the Village Association this summer to kind of test this uh, event out. Um, <coughs> we'll have more to report on that uh, later in the spring. Uh, the Simsbury Skate and Share, we brought that back this past December with collaboration between the, the police department, social services, the library was there as well. Uh, we raised a ton of food for the Simsbury Food Pantry. Um, it was a great event. Uh, we had a uh, celebrity Santa, who you'll see, <laughs> see in a minute, uh, if he's still on the line. The, um, but that was, that was a great event. Uh, the Pooch Plunge last year at Simsbury Farms was, was well attended. It was a great event, a good fundraiser for the, for the dog park. We hope to do that again this year. Um, and again, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> there he is, <laughs> still awake. The, the summer, uh, summer Concert Barbecue Family Day, we're hoping to do that in either Simsbury Meadows or Simsbury Farms to show off uh, our facilities. Um, that, that's the, that event is still uh, in development, but those are the, these are the type, just the, the tip of the iceberg of what we could do with that 5,000 and more down the line, hopefully. Are you, are you guys integrating this year at all with the uh, 350th? Uh, we, we are. Well, I, I am one of the staff liaisons. Right, but do you guys have anything that's one of these that could cross over, um, part of it, fill in the health so the, calendar? The September Fest is an event that, that a lot of my time is going to, so that's kind of the rec department's time. We're, as we're going to get to later on, we're a little understaffed at this point from a programming perspective, so uh -oh. I'm, I'm kind of covering oh. both of those positions. Mm -hmm. I only have so many hours in the day at this point. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think it could even be where it's not additional time, but like a co-branding opportunity where they use yes. their infrastructure Absolutely. to Yeah, to we're looking at doing some things with the pool during the They're summer. They're looking to fill that. their calendar out. Yeah. To with, I mean that in an honest way. Yeah. You could, also, yeah. they could help you create initiative in, in, in inertia for some of your yep. ventures here. Could we just make a note to talk about the pool plunge at some point offline? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Make sure it aligns with our risk management, mm -hmm. et cetera. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, just some quick pictures here. This is the, the pre-show movie night at the park. You can see the giant screen on the on the band shell there on the stage. This is what it looked like at night. Um, that was awesome. We had about 300 to, 300 to 400 people attend that event. It was it was really great. Um, and that's after postponing it and the whole mosquito scare last fall. Um, people still came out. A couple of shots. There's our skate and share. About 400 people for that event as well. Mm -hmm. That's all the food we collected that day. Mm -hmm. There was no admission, um, no charge for skate rentals or anything. That's mm -hmm. your admission was some canned goods, and that's what sh that's what we got. Nice. And there's 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 Santa. <laughs> <laughs> and we thank him very much for his time. Is that um, Santa in lockup on the left? <laughs> <laughs> so that was a great that was a great event. People, we got a lot of positive feedback from that. Um, our budget highlights this year. Again, we are still about the one of the lowest in our, in our comparable group here of, of sp uh, spending on our general fund spending mm -hmm. on our parks and recreation program in town. Um, I know that because we did the survey last year and our budget didn't change and the other towns still went up, so we have not moved there. Um, and we have a, we're asking for a number of CNR projects to continue to up, not upgrade, maintain our 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 fleet basically our our maintenance maintenance fleet and some uh, structural facility our facilities at Simsbury Farms and we're going to get into those in just a minute excuse me one second challenges this year our parks maintenance staff is continuing to try to keep up with the growing need for a growing need and expected demand and level of service in our parks and trails um, They've been doing a great job. They, they again, there's only so many hours a day and so many projects they can get to, and they work with uh, Orlando and his crew work with all of our youth sports organizations in town that use the ice rink to the the baseball fields, soccer fields, the football fields in town. Um, they work heavily with the athletic director at Simsbury High School to make sure that our our high school teams are playing on safe safe fields. Um, many of the much of the feedback we get back from other coaches and. Our youth coaches in town is our fields are, are the best that they play on um, when they go when they visit other towns. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to again continuing to, continuing to support the Simsbury Celebrates event as you saw last year was a, another great night um, with a spectacular ending, and then um, <laughs> Simsbury 350 this year we're spending a, we're spending a lot of time um, with we're working with them to make sure that those events come off uh, without a hitch and are a big success and. A true celebration of, of the, three, the great 350 years of Simsbury's uh, great 350 years of Simsbury. Um, we will have um, a, a couple of uh, changes in the upcoming fiscal year that we're anticipating. 
Mike Wallace, our golf superintendent, has let us know that um, we will no longer be able to count on his expertise, maybe with a phone call after the end of the end of the current golf season. So we will be seeking a, uh, a new golf superintendent, but we have someone in, in line, hopefully. Uh, we will be look our golf and uh, our golf pro and our golf restaurant contracts both expire at the end of the current golf. At the end, we, we open on Monday, so I guess I could say the end of our current golf season. Um, so we'll be working on on those in fiscal year 21 as well. Um, and we're going to be continuing to, as we do every day, day in and day out, evaluating how we're getting the message out to our uh, residents here and gaining visibility and recognition for our programs and uh, initiatives that the taxpayers of Simsbury are spending their good money on. Didn't you open the driving range this past? The driving week? range opened last week. The golf course will open on Monday, thanks to Mike and his team's right. efforts this winter sure. and the and the good weather we've been blessed yeah. with. Mike, you can, um, so a a good snowless winter is not a good thing. I I guess to some people, snowless winter is good, but to a golf course, sometimes I mean snow is good. You know. Sometimes. So how did you, how, <laughs> anecdotally how did did you guys have any snow damage this year or lack of or damage because of lack of snow? We, we historically always have a, a little bit of damage because we do not treat our, our fairways for winter diseases. Uh, but overall, the, the course came through the winter very well. And the lack of the snow cover since, you know, late December or whatever has allowed it to dry out a lot quicker than it normally does. Mm -hmm. So our groundwater level, you know, when it rains during the winter, the, the water runs off because the ground's frozen mm -hmm. and it doesn't soak into the ground. So once it started to thaw and everything, there wasn't a whole lot of water. You know, there wasn't a lot of snow at all. So it's dried out quicker this year than normal. So it's been a good, good winter. If I could take winters and have them all like this, I'd be thrilled. Mm -hmm. I'm sure Tom Roy would be too. <laughs> We're going to get to that this afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Tom. This winter has allowed us to get, we've been able to catch up on a lot of work that's been deferred. Um, you know, the guys haven't been able, you know, haven't been held up in the shop. They've been out doing tree, again, we've been trying to do some tree pruning. <laughs> 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 tree pruning where we can. He's uh, going to keep going. Uh, sign maintenance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that's that. actually sometimes the opposite. That if you're held inside, myself. you can do all of that necessary maintenance on your equipment as well, all your mowers, your your, your heavy equipment. That's one of the re reasons you have an off season. Mm -hmm. that right. you guys keep and that's a balance that we so let's get into our CNR projects we're on the home stretch here um, this is a 2004 uh, f-250 pickup that we're looking to replace it's over hundred thousand miles as you can see uh, it's it's been heavily used for plowing over the years uh, towing trailers that hundred thousand miles it, it's a it's a well-worn hundred thousand miles on that truck um, we're asking for forty two thousand for a new truck and plow um, any questions? I have. Where do you plow? Oh, we we plow all of the we plow all of the parks, um, Simsbury Farms, uh, uh, the parking lots at Sims, some of the uh, Simsbury Meadows. We do the senior housing at Owen's Owen Murphy Apartments. The okay. Parks Department is responsible for that. Um, where else, Orlando? Owensbrook West Street. The trail, yeah, the, yeah, the, the sidewalks on Owensbrook and West Street. Yeah. yeah. So. The. Our, and Simsbury Farms is open throughout. Most of the storms were open, just like the highway guys. We're, we try to keep it open throughout most of the storms because the rink, the rink is a winter sport. So we, we may have, during a storm, three guys, three or four people working just to keep Simsbury Farms open, the sidewalks cleared, the parking lot, the parking area safe. Okay. So, so some of it's sidewalks. It's not. It's some not. of it is sidewalks, yes. Yep. We do not plow trails, just mm -hmm. other than the Westbrook, and the, which are quasi sidewalks. Um, Let's get into staining. We have three facilities that need to be that need that are in need of staining. Um, we're hoping that they'll be done this year. This is our golf pro shop. You can see that it's been deferred maintenance here. This is one of our premier premier facilities in town, and this is what it looks like currently. Um, I'm going to get into pictures with the band shell and the Simsbury Farms main building. This is the Simsbury. This is an example of Simsbury Farms main building. You can see the checking. Um, we have sh we have cedar shingles buckling at this point on this building. Um, when they dry out and buckle and they eventually fall off, that's more more costly repairs. This is the band shell. Again, one of our whoops. I apologize. One of our premier facilities in town. 
Um, it needs to be done. Uh, there can be an argument made that maybe these buildings shouldn't have been cedar sided, but they are, and we're working mm -hmm. within what we have to what we have to deal with at this point. Mm -hmm. What's the cycle for those? It's supposed to be probably should be done every four to five years. We've yeah. been doing it. Three to five years, actually. What's that? Three to five years. Three to five years. years. We're, we're at about six years right now. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. This is another shot of of the, the staining at the Simsbury Meadows. Again, the second the shot on the right is is the um, painting repairs that, that need to be made on the ceiling there. This is just one example of it. There's water uh, water staining, um, seams are coming apart. Um, so that'll be part of that project as well, if we stain the stain that building. Uh, playgrounds and playground improvements. The, the board, the, your board, or the budget last year made a commitment to to start doing twenty five thousand dollars a year toward uh, our our smaller playgrounds in town. Um, what we're hoping to do is uh, twenty five thousand dollars doesn't go as far as you think. Just so we're, we're clear, <laughs> um, we're we're, we're hoping to use the twenty five thousand dollars from last year and the twenty five thousand dollars we hope to get this year to do a complete renovation of the play equipment that's pictured here at the uh, West Mountain Park. Um, that's our plan. We have a, we have a plan to rotate ar around as needed, but this is the one we've identified that that is in the most desperate need, and, and the money would be well spent here. Um, our parks and golf maintenance garage that was built almost a decade ago at this point was built without a ventilation system. And again, as we were talking about, just working in the off season during the winter time, typically it is it is cold. Um, they're working with paint and fumes and and on equipment. Uh, there's nothing to, without opening the large doors and letting all of the heat out, there's really no way to ventilate that space, space and keep it uh, safe for the, the, the techs that are working in that, uh, on those equipment. Um, so we're asking for a $10,000 ventilation system for that garage that, that probably should have been done when the building was built. So I would appreciate your support on that. Um, last year we made a commitment to start doing about a three-year a three uh, turnover on our ice rink. Uh, major equipment mm -hmm. systems last year this we're going to be doing the condenser that was approved last year this spr uh, this spring and summer uh, we'd like to match the control panel to that uh, condenser and then we'll hope we'll come back next year as it was pictured before and ask for the chiller um, but this co this control panel again it's with the original rink system which built uh, a little over 20 years ago now um, there was an engine se engineering study done in 2016 it was recommended that this unit be replaced with the others um, and this control system will allow for a higher degree of efficiency with the new equipment being installed. So there's, there will be a cost savings with that. And um, I think Jeff, Jeff just walked in the room. Our engineer did identify that it would be a, 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 wouldn't be that long of a payback on this system with, with the savings from the energy, energy efficiency. I thought it was going to be a quick, pretty, pretty quick payback. That's true. I'd have to look at that. Yeah, I, don't have, I didn't have it in front of me. It's been a while. Yeah. Um, the life expectancy. This will also allow us to, rem to remotely monitor the equipment, which we don't have the ability now. If something, for some reason, the Simsbury Farms power should go out when our second shift person leaves, we may not find out about it till the next day, and that could affect our ice mate, uh, heavily affect our ice maintenance for up to a week after that. Um, so now we can better adjust our equipment remotely. This is a picture of that panel. Cool. <clears throat> Getting on to the feasibility study at Curtis Park and, and uh, the Performing Arts Center. The Parks and Open Space Master Plan, one of the, one of the, large, one of the most important recommendations it's gonna make, the feedback that's come back, come back from our residents and in the focus groups, mm -hmm. is we have highly deficient parking areas and, and obviously restrooms at Curtis Park and Performing Arts Center. The Performing Arts Center parking lot is treacherous at times. Um, we regraded that lot last spring. We have a five year, per, five year permit to do so. But it still has accessibility issues um, for those using walkers or wheelchairs. Um, it is, uh, we're spending multiple hours out there lining during the summer um, from a whole different, many different perspectives. It's, it's, it's troublesome. Same thing with that Curtis Park. The two dirt parking lots over there are structurally deficient um, and inadequate for those spaces. So what we're looking for is $30,000 to do an engineering study. We have multiple wetlands and, and regula regulatory issues that would need to be addressed that's beyond our scope to do so. Bringing a consultant will allow us to come up with a, <coughs> uh, a plan that meets those requirements and give us a solid dollar amount to come back to you with um, to ask, for, you know, to, to identify what options we may have going forward as far as paving or alternative paving options for those parking lots. Memory serves me correctly. We, we paved one of the Curtis parking lots for thirty grand. That was Curtis B. Um, I don't believe Curtis B. 
we're just might know that's in the, that's not in the floodplain, correct? Um, uh, there was no regulatory issues at the time. At, at that one, and I don't believe that was. That was more of a driveway paving, not any parking lot. Yeah, that's it's true. More we paved the driveway going getting into between A and B. We didn't really pave parking. Yeah, but didn't the um, didn't the Friends of Soccer give us the other money to pave more of it? I thought it, it up right. to a point. It wasn't yeah. really a, just a little more of the apron dirt. going into it. So do we reasonably think that we're going to be able to get over the um, there are there are options there are side? options out there beside a hard <laughs> asphalt pave that might be doable at those sites and, and um, be acceptable for the, the commissions that would approve those projects. Yeah. So, I think this is an important one to explore, especially for yeah, ADA accessibility. It, it's, and, and it's identified as Everybody in town that took our survey and attended those <laughs> yeah. focus groups, one yeah. of the first things out of their mouth is you need to improve the parking area. It's no, no doubt. Yeah. My you thought just was just go ahead and do it. But, um, <laughs> but obviously there's more to it than that. <laughs> do we need to include other sites, boathouse, other parks? Because um, I know there's a lot of noise coming out of the crew team as well. Their parking access has been pretty <clears throat> antiquated as well. <clears throat> Certainly something we could look at. Though this, these were the two areas that were identified through the... Again, I was giving you some pre-highlights to the master plan presentation you're going to hear. Yeah. These were two of the areas that were identified. Crew yeah. areas, a younger population to parking in there. Yeah, it's a little it's more areas. limited in... You want 16-year-olds driving off the road? In the in the crew area? Yeah. I mean, that that, that hasn't been paved in since I was born, I think. So. Well, Mike never drove off the road when he was rowing down there. <laughs> <laughs> I just said I know there's been a, a substantial safety concern coming out of there due to the that volume. That was in the 1400s. Because it is a, it is a mm -hmm. public owned area. It's not just the crew team that goes down there. I, know, sure. I was just going to say the, the SPAC parking has come up quite a few times at aging and disability. Yes. Mm -hmm. they, 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 yes. Yeah. And they, the SPAC is a completely different. Mean, it's, it's, it's All I'm suggesting is can we get more than, than just those two sites for the 30 grand? Or is it going to increase the cost exponentially? I'd say no, and I, I would just say that the uh, boathouse in particular is particularly challenging from a regulatory standpoint. We actually looked at using that area for a lay-down lay area, for a compensatory storage area for our Riverside Road project. Okay. It was almost impossible to overcome the permits uh, because of the uh, wild and scenic the, uh, species and just the impact of the riverine environment down there. So it's going to be extremely challenging to do anything down there. To lay, a, to lay a new yes. piece of pavement when yes. we already have pavement? Yes. That's what I thought. We've got a substantial volume down there that we often forget about. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions on the feasibility study? Ooh. This is an example of that part of that yeah. parking lot. Oh yeah. This it's was last. Time. This was last yeah. spring it's before the um, the regrade. Um, that regrade. Thankfully, we haven't had a lot of snow and had, haven't had to do a lot of plowing down there this year, so it's it's held up better than than previous years. But you know, it, it, one of the other challenges is not just safety, but the people don't don't even know what is parking and what's not. Correct. Parking. Yeah. Correct. I mean, yep. and you're it's ruining a it's a pretty beautiful space. Yes. It's yes. A free for all yeah. So don't, don't we line that for every show, though? Isn't that part was something we talked about at one point? Uh, yeah, the parks maintenance staff uh, does line. <coughs> and we are reimbursed up to a point okay. by the um, Performing Arts Center. Yeah, okay, but yes. Remember. So that does have to be relined consistently. Now, if it was a regular parking lot, we, we'd line it once yeah, and it'd be done. Yes. So. Right. But we have um, substantial handicap parking down there. And uh, to your point Correct. earlier, folks get out of their cars, and it's that. Mm -hmm. yeah. that they got to walk yeah. through yeah. with, yeah. with yeah. ambulatory issues. It's just not safe. I mean, we do. The dog park gets a lot of use during the. I mean, it's not the playground still used during the winter. The dog park yeah. is used during the winter. I mean, yeah. you have people driving through this. Oh yeah. Yeah, we need we need to deal with it. You're absolutely right. And this is the, the example of Curtis Park. These are the two the two small dirt. Or the one on the right is the larger dirt lot. Uh, the, the one on the left is time. the smaller dirt lot over there. This one looks better than the first one. Show them in the other order. Yeah. Next time. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking for a better picture. Um, we're getting near the end here. This is we're hoping to to re you know start renovating our park signs. We most of our signs have been in the ground for many 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 years, um, and there's many different styles in those mm -hmm. within those signs. Uh, Orlando and his staff have done a great job of this this winter and last winter of begin taking down some of those older ones, trying to do their best to patch them together with with duct tape and glue and then putting a new coat of paint on them to make them match what we had with the new signs at Curtis Park or, I'm sorry Town Forest Park um, what we'd like to do is begin rotating with Simsbury Farms and a new the renovation process with Simsbury Farms and Curtis Park I'm sorry Memorial Park this year 
Um, if if the, the price comes in well enough we, and there's enough to fit another one, we do have a sign we're trying to, uh, we have to put at the new Flower Bridge Park um, as well. Mm -hmm. um, but this would be, again, a five-year plan to hopefully replace all of our signs from Belden Forest um, to Terrafield Park to uh, Onion Mountain Park. Make them all consistent, a consistent look. People know what they, you know, they know this is the town of Simsbury Park when they see this, mm -hmm. see this sign and, and a, a nice, consistent, professional look to it. Uh, this may be um, more complex than I'm giving you credit for, but is this something that Eagle Scouts, to a degree, the town could partner with? N not this particular sign. I think where we'd like to use the Eagle Scouts is on the trail signage and the trail marking. Um, again, that'll be noted in the Parks and Open Space Master Plan as, as something we're deficient in right now. But um, the materials used in these signs, uh, that's, that's a professional grade. Yeah. Um, we want them to hold up. Yeah, and again, we want, we want a consistent look um, going forward. Yeah. Uh, rink fencing at Simsbury Farms. The rink was again built 20, 20 some odd years ago. At this point, now those fence posts are now have begun rotted out. Um, as you can see in the picture, the fence is leaning to the left. Same. We have um, this is the same side of the rink where the where the hockey benches are. Yeah. Um, we have town staff going back and forth using this as an access from um, from the golf parking lot to the mechanical mm -hmm. room at the rink when there is snow and snow removal processes. Um, it's a safety fence. Um, even during the summer when people are out there walking around the rink, it, we, it separates that area from the pond. Um, yeah. And it's not a safe pond for anybody yeah. to be in. So we're asking for 8000 to replace that fence. And, and last but not least, uh, we have a $45,000 golf replacement uh, mower, a greens mower replacement. Um, that would be paid out of the golf equipment surcharge account. It is not a general fund purchase, just to be clear with that. Mm -hmm. um, and that mower does need to be replaced. We, Mike, Mike and his crew do a great job of maintaining the equipment, phenomenal job of maintaining the equipment. And as new equipment comes online, they bump it down. So a greens mower this year becomes, Mike, what, a T -mower. a T mower next year for a few years. And then it becomes a rough mower, right, or something. Maybe I'm wrong on that. No. I know they, re they recycle them down, and then eventually they trade it in or take it apart for parts. But they do a great job with that. Um, and again, that money is already currently set aside. Uh, we already have it, but we're asking you to approve it. Last but not least, the Greenway improvements, $135,000 in the capital project account, uh, again, to continue to maintain our trails um, in what our residents and our users expect. They, in, a, in a way, they, they should be maintained. I assume we have areas specifically earmarked for that improvement? Yeah, uh, Tom Roy can speak to more to the paving aspect. We'll continue <coughs> to work on fencing. I think we're working together, working from the south end of town north, northward, more or less. And it's, it's kind of unique because it's a project that's it's, it's a shared bucket of money between the two departments. And basically, yeah. um, we do what we call the capital improvement work as proposed to the maintenance work. So last, um, last year, we did from Canal all the way to the town line. We brought the stone dust back up. For anybody who's ever run down there, there was like a two-inch lift, oh, yeah. which mm -hmm. you talk about insurance claims and an ankle turn and mm -hmm. everything else. And the other thing we were able to do, there's a couple areas where the trail was sloughing off mm -hmm. into the wetland um, without impacting the wetland. We actually <laughs> drove down vertical posts and actually built the trail back up to those vertical posts. Yeah. It was um, mm -hmm. kind of a neat application, um, some really good nerdy engineering stuff going on there. <laughs> uh. So this, this coming year, what we're looking at right now are, are two, two projects, one being um, resurfacing that trail from Canal South. One of the real challenges is what is the right surface because the condition of the pavement is not such that it really warrants a full traditional overlay. It's spot areas that have not performed well. So we're looking yeah. at do we cut those areas out, patch those in with traditional asphalt, and then go over the top of everything with something, a thinner material that's going to help preserve everything and keep it uniform. And then we're also looking at doing a significant trail enhancement to the um, Farmington River Trail, which is right at the intersection of um, Bushy Hill and West Street, mm -hmm. which is heavily used by the um, high school kids. Um, there's forever been the shortcut um, from the high school directly to the trail. Um, DOT got rid of the crosswalk there a couple, of, I think two years ago, and part of that was they want people to cross where there's a signalized crossing. Mm -hmm. And to that end, we want to make sure that that front entrance of that trail is more accommodating for that. So that's some of the projects that are coming online using both the remaining funds from the previous um, capital allotment and the upcoming 130,000. Okay, I appreciate that. Gives me some context. And trees. <laughs> <laughs> trees and fencing. And fencing. Yes. And fencing. Yes, and more importantly, the roofs. The roofs. You got to stress the 
the roots. <laughs> yeah, well, the roots are what's causing some of the issues on the trail, right? As we yeah, saw on the yeah. north end. And it's a catch-22 because everybody loves the picturesque, beautiful trail in the like shade. Trail. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what's infiltrating the yeah. trail yeah. system. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Proposed service restoration. This is not an improvement. <laughs> Losing a theme here with this. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, back in the mid '90s, the park rec, park rec department was at ten full-time staff members. Uh, Parks department was at ten full-time staff positions, funded through the general fund. Um, over time, that went down. That has gone down to seven uh, general fund positions. Uh, we do that. that it is exclusive of the two two uh, personnel that the school board currently funds, um, guys who maintain the, the athletic fields there. Um, our Parks and Open Space Master Plan is gonna recommend two to three additional park staff. Um, what we're asking for is a, um, I'll give you an example, I'm skipping ahead here. The, um, over the last 30 years, I'm gonna show you what we've added here. Simsbury Performing Arts Center has come online. The, town, the, ball, the ball field at Town Forest Park, the Terrafield Green has come online. Memorial Park expanded by two fields. Um, we've expanded the rink season by four weeks. The Rails the Trails project added a higher level of maintenance and expectations for that. Uh, the town purchased the Ethel Walker Woods and its trail system. Uh, we're adding the new park at Hopbrook Landing and we've installed and, ma and are maintaining irrigation, fee uh, irrigation systems at all of these, most of these parks that we've, we've added, the Performing Arts Center. Um, this all takes time. So this was all when we had, this was before we had the 10, when, before we had the 10, we had the 10, we lost them, and then we've been adding all of these things, and we haven't added any more staff to take care of it. Um, it doesn't, doesn't add up there. Um, so what we're asking for is, is a commitment from the, from the board and the Board of Finance to start um, adequately staffing our, our parks department to maintain that infrastructure. Um, we're asking for a parks and facilities maintenance techni technician. Um, currently, we have our, some oddities in our park structure, parks maintenance department structure right now. Our parks, our parks superintendent is doing, is splitting his time doing the work of the parks foreman, assigning job, assigning job tasks and checking on work orders. He should be working on higher level projects. Our parks foreman is basically doing this job at this point. Um, he's doing the, the general facility repairs, the electrical, the plumbing, um, and trying to keep up with it as best as he can, but he's not doing the job that we're paying him to do. Um, so that's where we're asking for your help. Um, certainly we're not, we're not um, oblivious to the fact that we would need a parks and facilities maintenance technician 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, when there aren't, aren't these projects, uh, these HVAC and painting projects and carpentry projects that do, that person will be assisting with the mowing, the lining, the other things that our parks maintenance staff uh, certainly takes care of, the mechanicals. Um, but this position is needed for us to help uh, restructure the department, work more efficiently, um, accomplish the, the tasks that we need to do um, with the staff that we have. So certainly more is needed, but this would go a long way to helping us out. Any questions? I have questions. Yes. So you're asking for potentially two or three more staff? Over the next, we're not asking for it this year. We're asking for the one this year, and we'll come back as, as the, the further needs are addressed. And we're cognizant of the, of the, the town's ability to fund these positions as well. We're, not, we're certainly not being greedy <laughs> by, any, by any stretch, but this has been identified as a need for many, many years. Uh, and. Um, so that's where we're at. It'll be two to three positions over the next seven years, eight years, nine years. Okay. I have one other question. Um, other things, there's a, there's a lot of other needs or items on your list if you had to prioritize. Well, the equipment, this is, are you talking about equipment needs or the position? The position you're, you're going to be paying for every year. That's sure. not going to go away. So equipment needs. Everything that's on there is something we need. If you're asking me if there's something else we, we would like to have, is that the, is that the question? Nope. If, What's the biggest if priority? Gonna get, if you weren't going to get all of those things, <clears throat> yeah. what would your priority be? What we're leading up to is CNR is over, so we're going to have to make some decisions later. This, I'd rather hear Yeah, from you're, you. you're looking at, I mean, this is... The building's staying would have to This be is... The wrong building. It's on, it's on sightly. It's, it's going to lead to further maintenance if we defer it, um, defer it any longer. Um, it's just going to cost us more. Uh, by, by doing the three of these projects this year, we hope to get a better price than if we did them th mm -hmm. one this year, one sure. next year, one yeah. the following year. That makes year. sense. Um, so certainly that's a priority. Um, we had submitted what we thought were, f uh, a, a, we have a very good, cap what we think is a good capital plan for the next six years, seeing our plan for the next six years. Yeah. The projects we put in this year's plan, we, we thought were all fair. Certainly not every one of them could be, could not, be 
right. um, could be in there. The ones that, that the town manager has chosen to push forward, they're all needed. They're, there's nothing that's there that's not that, that we can I agree. get away I without just... doing longer. I guess that's the best way to put it. They all seem fair. It's yeah. not that. It's just, no, I understand. it's just budget. Yep. Yeah. To, to build on Jackie's point, yeah, we got 321 in total car, total parks and rec mm -hmm. from the CNR, and yeah. 45 of it is the Greensmore. So take that out. I mean, we only spend 461 total. So in prior years. So unless there's a whole new pot of money that I don't know about. Uh, nope. So um, if, if you might, if you might recall, um, <laughs> so the last couple of years we've done, um, we've used the 416 payback method, but then we've also done an additional cash contribution for some of the smaller capital needs. Yep. Um, so this would be, if we ultimately went with that strategy, this would be our third year of doing that. Um, and we are going to do under the CNR um, and capital wrap up at the end of the day, talk about that problem of that now that we have really begun to develop the CNR six year plan, which didn't exist previously and talking about those baseline needs is on average, we're looking at about um, really having about two million in needs a year for those smaller capital needs that are falling under two hundred fifty. I'm with you, but we haven't gotten the board of finance there yet. Is the problem right? Right. So again, so what we've done, so. right, right, right. <laughs> so it's it's a matter of what we want and what we can actually fund. Right. Exactly. So um, under the proposed budget, what we did do is we utilized the four sixteen payback method for some of the CNR projects, yep. but then an additional um, cash contribution um, to fund some additional smaller capital projects. That is somewhat uh, not somewhat that is consistent with what we've done the last two years. Um, but ultimately, right. I think over time, it's it's that reality of, you know, 416 is, is not enough for our smaller capital needs as we no. begin to quantify the baseline. 100% agree with you. Yeah. But, it, but as I go through this, and I know we're doing saying our letter, but yeah. it's important because Tom's standing here. Yeah, we've, exactly. we've, got, we've got a million one in the general fund. If you assume 416, we got 600,000 plus of cash. That we're going to pay for the rest of this stuff. Um, partially. So um, there are a couple of op uh, operating budget transfers in. So right now, the operating budget um, has $180,000 for one of the PW trucks that gets transferred into the CNR, and that was outside of the 416. Okay. So it's 400. Um, and then also, the um, you might recall the Board of Finance last year decided to move the police cruisers out of the 416 payback method and yep. into the operating. Mm -hmm. So that one. We don't get held harmless on those. Uh, so got to pay for them. Yes, right. So that is in the operating, but that will be an operating transfer in. So if you take the um, the cruisers yep. and the public works truck and the 416, we're at about 730 or 735,000 really that we have truly kind of cash that's on hand. Um, but in addition to that, the last few years we have done an additional cash contribution to help catch up with some of these capital needs, yeah. the smaller capital needs. No, I, I, again, I'm not pushing on it, but yeah. Jackie's really well pointed question we're going to get asked to send a list up of prioritization so stainings number one and then i assume the trucks maybe not the playscape but i bet my kids i don't know if kids go in there yeah. but i'm just saying like yeah, is that the, i mean that particular one it's, it's like across the street from my house but i'm not pushing for it for sure um <laughs> but what it's at the point where it's dangerous i mean i wouldn't oh, want it, okay. kids it, it playing is, on it, it. and to take well, it if we take it out there's yeah, nothing there the twenty five thousand that was a lot of last year isn't enough to just to, to go put something even right. similar back that unit that's there is probably more than twenty five thousand dollars back in its day yeah. that's what they to that call. to that point the but longer you put it and this has been and dave, dave bush and, and jerry who Wetchen, who are here can speak to the to the past budget better than i can the, the parks maintenance budget has been let's just call it the 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 facilities money spent on facilities has been has been very underfunded over mm -hmm. the last 20 years we're not we're not trying to catch it all up in one in one fell swoop here mm -hmm. it's just the longer some of these things get put off they become unsafe um, it's going to cost us more to, re to replace some of these some of the equipment down the line yeah, um, yeah. we can't take we can't play games with the ice rink nope. uh, well, some I, of these things I that agree we're, you have mechanicals that yeah, are 20 the, the, and 30 years old correct so, but you know if we're going to talk about priority then that would have to be a priority it over, would the, the rink is a priority yes over a playscape yeah but, but i would i would say though that whether you fix it or pull it out i feel like we got to make I mean, it becomes a safety issue at some point. Mm -hmm. It does, but we got to pay for it, guys. I mean, yeah. we have this argument with the Board of Finance every year. They go, that's great. Tell us what the 1 through 10 is, and something ends up being 10. Well, the, so. the other thing I'm looking at is next year. Like, that's, that's like oh, a yeah. million dollars more 
So anything you take out from this year, right, you could potentially be looking further. Right, right. And that's, that's one of the... Yeah, so that's, again, that is one of the challenges. So up until yeah. um, the current fiscal year we're in now, um, we were never budgeting for those smaller capital purchases except for looking at it in the year that was coming up. Mm -hmm. And that, again, was something that we had identified as a real deficiency in our capital budgeting mm -hmm. process. So um, this is now our second year where we are really starting to project out over the next six years what are those smaller um, capital items. And so what we did is we did our best to say, okay, what are, and again, these are really, investments in our existing infrastructure as opposed to um, it, nice to haves or enhancements. And we really took the items that we felt were um, the most critical, either for a safety perspective um, or some other, again, what, what are the things that are most critical and then pushing out yeah. items into other years. Oh, um, so again, we did do our best at a staff level to really say, okay, what are those most critical replacement items, things that are rotted, falling, you know, falling apart, the playscapes, um, or what are things that are truly um, safety issues like the ice ring fencing or the garage ventilation system. So we really tried to prioritize what was most urgent and then try to push out everything everything else. But what doesn't get picked up though is, is traditionally we would have the 800,000 or a million that got transferred to the, to, the, um, to the the fund balance. And then whatever was extra revenue, generally the Board of Finance would allow cash purchases in the prior year. So we'd get to this point of the process, we'd see that there's an extra million dollars um, otherwise coming in from building permits, and they would let us go pull items off this list and fund them. So it never showed up in the budget. They were purchased. Mm -hmm. So it's not that we weren't buying things. It's just it was, it was done a different way. We've switched in how we do it. The Board of Finance doesn't let us do that anymore. Right. Um, and they not, not right or wrong, but it, it's different. So now all those items are backing up and yeah. becoming a log jam due to the change in process. Now there's been a good reason for it. We've had tough years from a grand list standpoint. We've had state changes, um, you know, the retirement, the, the, all these things get shoved down on the municipality, so it's been hard. Yeah. But we were buying these mowers and everything else, just not all of it went to CNR. And again, you can look back and, you know, your Amy's predecessors, there was, you know, several hundred thousand dollars every year where I think the street lights were bought that way, right, Tom? Or, or you know, we we we'd all agree that it made sense. The eight hundred thousand would come from current fiscal year, so it never got carried forward to the next budget year. Yeah. So it was being paid for. It's just how and when it was being paid for. Right, and and, and we've lost that to some extent. It's not the board of finances' fault. They've got a lot of things they got to pay for. Right, and and we will talk a little bit more. Um, about that issue uh, during the wrap up at the end of the day, because um, we had essentially recommended um, with capital project savings um, through capital project closeouts at fiscal year end, as well as other budgetary savings, um, we had proposed uh, moving that into the capital reserve. So we would yeah. have cash on hand for a lot of these smaller projects during the budgeting season. Right. Um, you might recall um, that I think that philosophically this board was in line with that. Right. Ultimately, the Board of Finance just moved that money to uh, the general fund reserve. So um, that will be sort of part of some of, some of the additional conversations later this afternoon. Okay. Great. Any other questions? Thank you. Nice job, Tom. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Tom, yeah. Orlando, and Mike, for, for being here today. And no, but it's a good discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Dave, Dave, Dave Bush and Barbara Bush made some, what kind of scones? Dave? I listen to you. <laughs> Cranberry stones and chocolate stones. Whoa! Oh, right. All right! Sure, sure. Look at that. Approved! Should have led with that. I would like to express my thanks. You folks spent your whole day here. Uh, we appreciate the time and the effort on behalf of everyone at Park and Rec. You're doing a great job. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. And we appreciate the level of engagement that the your organization provides. Absolutely. And so many residents in this town, just like I always say, and so many other, have no idea how much gets done because of volunteers and because of the strength of having committees like yours and commissions. So thank you guys for your involvement. Good luck the rest of the day. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> we get to come back in 20, 25, 30. 20 minutes, that's all you give What do you come think? Come on. Yeah, well, the food's here, so, right. yeah. It's warm. Uh, there it goes.